Well, good morning to everyone. Get this? Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to see all of you today. And uh, as the coordinator of this event, I'm happy to announce the beginning of the 22nd International Music Theory Conference, Principles of Music Composing, Aspects of Communication. This is the 22nd conference already, and uh, the event started more than 20 years ago in 1999. Since then, every year, the specific and different subject has been covered and analyzed, such as creative process, sacred music, the phenomena of rhythm, melody, audiation, and many others. Each conference has been accompanied by a specific publication in English, and most of them you will be able to acquire during this event as well. This year, the conference focuses on the communicative aspects of music. 
the multifaceted nature of this subject requires us to approach it from very carefully selected angles, which include the social cultural context of the composer and composition, the conceptual idea and purpose of the composition, the intended venue, implementation of technology, interpretation by the performer, reception by the audience, and other aspects. 24 presentations will be made during the three days of the conference by speakers from such countries as Austria, Greece, Italy, the United Kingdom, Poland, Lithuania, Portugal, Ghana, Serbia, Ukraine, and Germany. Also, the two concerts will complement the program of the conference. And I would like to express many thanks to the organizers and supporters of this event. The conference is organized by Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theater and Lithuanian Composers Union. And it is supported by Lithuanian Council for Culture. And now I would like to invite to say a few words and to address the audience, the vice rector of the Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theater, Ramune Bolevichuk. Good morning, dear colleagues and dear guests. I'm extremely happy to welcome all of you here at our academy. And um, I have to say that this conference is one of the major events of the academy. And uh, the event itself is very vivid and, and really rich in terms of the content. And um, I'm really impressed by the scope of the research as well as the, as well as by geography of the participants. And um, as it was mentioned also, the publications are really of uh, very high scientific quality. So I would like to, Thank uh, the organizers and to you, all the participants. And um, this year's topic, uh, communicative aspects, I believe it is a, a really important topic. And uh, of course, there are a lot of aspects of communication, but the main purpose is to establish the relations, different kind of relations. Unfortunately, now we are facing the situation of the war and not only the severe violence of Russia against Ukraine, but also the information warfare. And I believe that during such periods, art can be used as a powerful tool against propaganda and also communication through arts and in arts can establish communities and keep and, and helps to keep people together, the artists together, the who may uh, uh, have different beliefs and, and artistic concepts and, and uh, different artistic views, but who share the same values. So I wish you very fruitful, very productive, work and, and interesting discussions and enjoy your news. Thank you. Thank you. And I would also like to, to introduce the head of the scientific committee and the founder of the conference, Professor Rimanta Senelauskas, please. We will. It is a pleasure for me to welcome dear guests, participants, and all those who have come to this 22nd conference, International Conference on Music Theory. I wish all of you productive and creative work, new scientific ideas, a pleasant atmosphere of communication, and all the very best I wish you every success. Good luck.
So due to the hybrid form of the conference, the presentations and discussions will also be available on Zoom platform as well as live. Uh, the whole event is also broadcasted live by uh, via the YouTube channel of, of the Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theatre, so the significant amount of audience is also expected to be online. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I, I hope uh, we will have a very productive and creative work. I invite you to, to exchange ideas and uh, actively... Uh, <clears throat> discuss uh, all the topics and uh, now I will give the floor to the moderator of the first session Ramunas Motekaitis. Dear colleagues, dear guests, it's indeed Ah, oh, very strange, some reverberations. Okay, no problem. So indeed, it's pleasant to be here in a significant event. Yes, it's everything like last year, the same November, the same gloomy atmosphere. And you know, today it was the first snow. It's not visible in the city, but fields around is already covered by snow. So it's kind of a good sign for, for, for us. And yes, of course, it's very luxury to have discussions about our art and aesthetics when in the world the situation is not so usual as, as before. So let's enjoy, let's have wonderful time, let's have inspiring conversations. And I would like to invite our first speaker today, this, this so Silvia Makomas, right, from Institute of Musicology, University of Warsaw, Poland. She will present the paper, which is called Acoustic Wallpaper Under Control, Musique d'Amblement and Audio Marketing, right? Uh, I will try to um, yes, and chefs in the with all the lines. Microphone. As you wish, actually. Yeah, so it depends. Ah, okay, so I don't need it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning, uh, once again. It's a great honor to be the first speaker. And as, uh, as uh, sorry, Raimun, Raimunas, yes, as Raimunas said, uh, I'm representing the Institute of Musicology. Uh, University of Warsaw, and I hope you will find my paper uh, interesting. Probably around 1920, uh, a French composer, Eric Satie, arranged a meeting uh, with, with his friends in one of the restaurants in Paris. The meeting has created that is music which would be part of the ambience which would take account of it i imagine it being melodic in nature it would soften the noise of knives and forks without dominating them without imposing itself it would furnish those silences which sometimes hang heavy between diners it would save them from everyday banalities at the same time it would neutralize those street sounds which impinge on us indiscreetly. The mentioned story usually functions as the genesis for the sati concept of furniture music, treated as an object accompanying all daily events. 
In principle, such music shouldn't engage the listener. It is supposed to perform other functions. It's worth mentioning that the concept of furniture music was introduced in the turbulent time of early 20th century by a composer who was a colorful, enigmatic, and cross-disciplinary figure in the Parisian avant-garde. He was active in several spheres of art, from cabaret to religion, from calligraphy to poetry and playwriting, cooperating with the lead, leading avant-garde figures of the day, including Jean Cocteau, Pablo Picasso, Sergei Diaghilev, Claude Debussy, and Igor Stravinsky. He was a witness of many groundbreaking changes in various art movements and technology. The idea of furniture music was brought into life by means of works which were classified by the composer as musique d'amblement, titled and described in a very specific way. The first two pieces composed in 1917 were probably never published and performed during Satie's lifetime. Sonic Floor Ties was composed to be played during lunch or civil marriage. Another work, Wrought Iron Tapestry, was composed, quote, for the arrival for, of the guests at the grand reception to be played in an entrance hall. So we can listen. I hope it works. <laughs> Yeah, and the second one, I'm sorry. Okay, quite a high social status of the occasions during which the music was meant to be played is not reflected by the music structure itself. Both pieces rely on only four bars repeated as long as it is needed. Satie used basic quasi ostinato structures which looped and played endlessly seem to resemble a perpetual mobile machine or barrel organ music. Another cycle, Industrial Sounds was meant to be performed as an entr'acte to Max Jacob's play. The premiere of Jacob's comedy took place in 1920 in an art gallery in Paris that exhibited contemporary art. According to the plan, Satie's music was performed during the free entr'actes of the play. It was the first public performance of furniture music during the composer's lifetime and with his active participation. I would like to pay your attention to the pre-review of the event published three days before its premiere. Quote, you will see that this novelty, despite its surprising name, is worthy of your attention. Just like the decorative motifs of a tapestry or frieze are repeated uniformly to contribute to a bigger picture, picture the motifs of furniture music will be repeated incessantly and it will be pointless to listen to them. The words can be treated as a kind of manual for furniture music listeners. Unfortunately, the audience couldn't meet its demands. Darius Mio, who performed on the grand piano together with Satie on that day, described the audience reactions in the following words, quote, contrary to our instructions, as soon as the music started, the listeners hurried back to their seats. Sati shouted in vain, talk, walk around, don't listen. They listened, they were quiet, it was a failure. Sati hadn't counted on his music appeal. There is no doubt that in case of furniture music, the term wallpaper took a new meaning. On the one hand, 
it indicates re repetitiveness of a given pattern as it is guiding principle. But what is the most interesting for my research, it also refers to the auditory and psychological effect. The term acoustic wallpaper perfectly illustrates the situation in which acoustic stimuli, for example, music, are located on the periphery of attention of the listener and thus they are perceived as an acoustical background. The artistic concept of Eric Satie turned out to be a prophetic vision in the context of the ubiquity of music in the contemporary world. Nowadays, in many everyday situations, music functions as an acoustic background. On the one hand, music constitutes a vital element of the human, individually shaped acoustic environment, and on the other hand, it appears in the public space, often as an acoustic wallpaper imposed on a listener. In the second case, music usually functions somehow beyond listener's attention, and because of an inattentive way of perception, it can become a very effective tool of hidden persuasion and even manipulation within the strategy that can be termed acoustic engineering. I defined it as a strategy that involves designing construction and modification of the acoustic space of a given place by means of programmed music with the use of scientific and technical knowledge. Its purpose is to modify uh, or change the recipient's responses and behavior in a way that is consistent with the values and interests of the sender. In such an approach, music is embedded in the framework of the social communication model, which assumes that the final result of the communication process is to control the recipient's responses and behavior, usually without their knowledge. One of the most interesting examples of acoustic engineering is the strategy of audio marketing. This is a strategy that can be defined as a service that consists in effectively influencing the customer's behavior at a point of sale by means of formatted music programs. It is implemented in a wide range of places such as department stores, supermarkets, niche stores, restaurants, hotels, also in my hotel in, in Vilnius, beauty parlors and airlines. Uh, to understand the key aspects of audio marketing, it is necessary to look behind the scenes of the process of music programming. Now I would like to focus and present the practical aspects of audio marketing on the example of Polish company IMS, which is the first and the biggest audio marketing service provider on the Polish market. As you can see, when IMS started its activities in the year 2000, so over a decade after a historical breakthrough, it had only one client. It has grown rapidly. Currently, it is the biggest audio marketing service provider on the Polish market. It serves about 30,000 trade and service points and reaches about 30 million consumers every week. It is also active in 24 other European countries. The process of music programming on the example of IMS is quite interesting. Music programs are created by experienced music consultants in the process of programming. They take into account two main sources of information. First, the, the data provided by the clients of the audio marketing company, and also they use the results of scientific and marketing research. The, the company undertakes actions similar to those used in creating advertising campaigns uh, to facilitate the flow of information. Uh, they prepared a special brief containing questions referring to the brand's target group and to the customer's expectations concerning the aims of audio marketing. The, aim, the aims of the audio marketing activity uh, defined by the client usually include such effects as image creation, increasing customer activity at the point of sale, as well as reducing background noise or fostering a relaxing and energizing impact. Afterwards, uh, on the basis of the consumer's demographic data and information concerning the brand image, music consultants create an appropriate music program. In the process of selecting pieces for the playlist, 
Music consultants rely mostly on research commissioned by IMS and on scientific research on the effect of music on consumer behavior. At the stage of music programming, one of the most important aspects is musical preference of a target group. At trade and service points offering a single brand, the music must be suited as much as possible to the preferences of the target group. But if the company's aim is to build or alter the brand image, the customer's musical preference are less important. In the latter case, they, the aim of audio marketing is to attract potential customers to a given shop while music becomes an element of the brand's image context. Completely different aspects dominate in programming, programming music to retail chains, chains where fast moving consumer goods are sold. The main aim there is to increase sales and to control the customer flow. Therefore, the music programs for such venues usually consist of popular music in fast tempos. The control of customer flow is also very important in fast food restaurants. The main tool for playlist generation is RCS Selector, which catalogs compositions, allows to create music programs, analyzes them and controls the database, as well as facilitates efficient preparation of playlists for such a large number of clients. IMS sends the playlist to point of sale via the internet and monitors the day-to-day -day operation of the programs at the client's venue. The music is forwarded from the IMS server to the music servers in each individual venue. Both concepts provoked the following theoretical questions that I think are very important for, for this conference. How can the sender in the process of musical communication manage the listener's attention in such a way to achieve the effect of acoustic wallpaper? The second question, what function from the perspective of the sender is performed by acoustic wallpaper? Is it a target result or a mechanism leading to certain reactions in an indirect way? What factors play a decisive role for the efficiency of an adopted strategy? To understand what factors can determine whether the particular auditory effect is achieved or not, it's worth to use the reciprocal feedback model of musical response. It was proposed by the British social psychologists of music, David Hargraves, Raymond MacDonald and Dorothy Mill. The researchers stressed that music is a fundamental channel of communication. It provides a means by which people can share emotions, intentions, and meanings. What's more, via music, highly complex informational structures and contents can be communicated extremely rapidly between people. In the author's approach, based on the principle of mutual determinism, the listener's reactions to music are viewed as an interaction between the listener's characteristics, music, and context which modifies the listener and if possible the music. If we treat the effect of acoustic wallpaper as an intended result of an interaction between three dimensions, music, listener and context, there should be some modification. In my opinion, two other elements should be included, sender's intentions and final results, which don't always have to coincide with the intention of the sender. In the last part of my presentation, I would like to look once again at both concepts through the prism of the acoustic wallpaper model. In case of furniture music, Satie focused, focused on structural properties of music and the specific situational factors. Repeated elements were supposed to make the listener not pay attention to music and direct the attention to other st stimuli. However, it turned out that his idea didn't fall on fertile ground since for the listeners used to listening attentively to music of an artistic quality, the passive perception of music was a challenging and sorry, incomprehensible task. As I mentioned before, this is evidenced by the reaction of confused listeners who couldn't ignore live music of industrial sounds even though they were instructed to do so. 
we can say that in case of SATI's concept, the effect of acoustic wallpaper wasn't achieved. Therefore, from the perspective of its effectiveness, it was a failure caused by the auditory habits of the listener. The case of audio marketing seems, seems to be more complicated. The overall analysis of the process of music programming shows that from the perspective of the sender, audio marketing should be treated as a specific and pragmatic form of musical communication in which programmed music is tailored to the intended purposes. It focuses on the final effect, which is a modification or alteration of the listener's reactions and behavior according to the sender's intentions. As claimed by neuropsychologist Stephen Brown, in such pragmatic form of communication, message generation depends both on the process of affective modulation, called stimulation, and on the process of coupling these affective musical sounds to social objects, associations. So at lower levels, the sender uses the mechanism of directed stimulation. Music is used to produce rather immediate effects on attention, arousal, emotion, and mood. In this case, music has clear design features of communication. The sender uses formulaic devices, including scale types, melody types, rhythm types, tempos, volumes, or registers. At higher level, called directed associations, the sender uses music to produce symbolic associations between musical structure and cultural objects. This process is similar to directed stimulation, except that it occurs at a higher level of meaning generation. However, the acoustic wallpaper is optional. In practice, the listener usually balances between active and passive perception. The final results are very difficult to predict, and due to interpersonal variabilities, it is not easy to indicate the factors that decide about the way of perception. But there is no doubt that in case of audio marketing, music is an effective marketing tool and a channel of communication, what is confirmed by many empirical studies. Music is able to trigger various responses on physiological, affective, and even cognitive level, and the consumers usually implement this scenario planned by the sender. Of course, due to the high effectiveness uh, of audio marketing strategy, some um, questions of ethical character may appear. Probably most of you are wondering if such activities should be allowed. There is no consensus on this issue in the scientific world, especially since the science often cooperates with the business. So in many cases, the research results are implemented in practice. Regardless of ethical doubts, the perspective of acoustic wallpaper model enabled the interesting comparative studies of apparently distant phenomena. In my opinion, further interdisciplinary research is also possible. The model can be modified and applied in various fields covering not only examples of acoustic engineering or artistic concepts, but also individual practices of contemporary listeners who in everyday contexts very often create their own auditory bubble, as it is called. Thank you very much for your attention. And that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Pauline, it's, it's time for questions for this intriguing paper. A lot of things we didn't know how we are manipulating. Uh, yeah. Ah, yes. Some comments as well. Yes. <laughs> Does it work? Yes, it does. Thank you for your great paper. I think I think I have uh, two questions. I'll ask one and then maybe I'll ask the one if no, yeah. Uh, my first question was about Muzak, mm -hmm. how the concept of yeah. Muzak fit into your model. Yeah, of course. I, I didn't mention it, but um, 
last year uh, I, I wrote a book about, uh, about uh, different concepts of acoustic wallpaper. And of course, the concept of music is one chapter <laughs> in my book. So it is, of course, very intriguing uh, concept um, that also provokes a lot of ethical questions. Mm -hmm. But actually, it is, um, I would say that audio marketing uh, concept derives and has roots in music actually um, and music concept the genesis of music concept is strictly connected with uh, the psychology uh, of work and uh, in the um, first decades of the uh, 20th century uh, the companies uh, owners they wanted to improve uh, the the quality of work as well uh, as the time of work so there was a big tendency you know to to use scientific research to improve uh, the the tempo of work so that that was the, the that is the, the genesis but um, in my research i also found some roots in music therapy that's also mm -hmm. interesting that there there are some common uh, common research that were used in music therapy and in music in music concept. So a lot of common things, I would say. Uh, well, um, you said uh, something like um, um, the effectiveness of this audio marketing. Mm -hmm. Is there any hard, solid research into what exactly the effects are, how, uh, how uh, effective it is. Yeah. yeah. Except from the vague idea that people will perhaps be more stimulated to yeah. like. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, of course. It's, it's a very difficult question, I would say, but there are a lot of um, mm, not quality because we can use quantitative methods and quality methods to, to, uh, to, uh, um, estimate the effectiveness of audio marketing. Uh, the best um, thing is uh, the, to observe the tendency of selling. So if you if the the owner of the shop um, um, observes that the sale is higher, uh, it means that it works, but it's not the answer. It's not so easy, actually. Of course, uh, uh, you, you, yeah, you because can really, you need to carve yeah, this because, precisely. Uh, of music. course, in in empirical studies, it is easier to extract music, but uh, from other factors. But uh, in uh, in natural conditions, music is one of the aspects of modern shops. So we have also aroma marketing. Yeah, we have also uh, other aspects of merchandising, for example, how the products are placed on the shelves, it is also very important. So in natural conditions, I would say it is very difficult to, to, um, to estimate the effectiveness, but in uh, experimental conditions, it is easier. So we can use uh, qualitative uh, methods and qualitative uh, aspects, dimensions, and uh, quantitative. So for example, the quality of products are also estimated. Uh, the number of products, how many time people spend in one place, uh, what is the customer flow, how, how do they move from one point to another, uh, how many, for example, bottles of wine are, are uh, sold, uh, there is a very famous experiment uh, when uh, when uh, the researchers used typical French music and typical German music, and it turned out when uh, German music is in the background, uh, German wines, uh, bottles of wine, uh, yeah, you know, the number of bottles of wine were higher. So there are many, you know, answers for these questions. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make a short comment. Uh, the 
pieces that you mentioned mm -hmm. by Satie and uh, like Tapisserie mm -hmm. and uh, Song Industrial, yeah. they really ring a bell to me because uh, they really coincide with uh, pieces of uh, like Lithuanian modern composers, myself included, <laughs> uh, like Tapisserie from Justyna Rapeczkaita or Song Calligraphy from me. Um, they are meant to be listened, but they share some uh, like non-musical kind of stuff, uh, style like patterns that are really uh, wallpaper-like, yeah. and that's really f fruit for thought for me. Yeah. And what one more uh, thing that I was really um, uh, how to say, I, I was really excited to give your presentation to Ramunas to moderate because he once said uh, about his own music that it should not be actively listened to and we should uh, <laughs> like do our household works wh while we listen to it so. <laughs> but it's uh, but it's the same with ambient mu music for example Brian Eno in my book I also wrote about his concept uh, but uh, uh, you know I only selected uh, I, I think that Satie inspired a lot of composers, a lot of ideas I didn't say about it, but uh, I also didn't say about it that he was really afraid of technological progress. <laughs> so that is very interesting that he made, he made uh, uh, mechanical music, but at the same time, he was afraid of technology. He didn't use, for example, underground, he walked, uh, and uh, um, so, so it's th there are some very interesting aspects also of of his uh, attitude to technology, because we we can find uh, a lot of um, continuation of of these ideas uh, in in many you know artistic concepts and also and also um functional concepts but general i think that uh, sati wasn't <laughs> precursor he he uh, music because he was actually against this kind of concepts so that's that's my comment as well mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, my my second question now, uh, uh, speaking of composers um, who were inspired by sati so um, when you were talking about um, the sati focused on the structure right yeah. and the repetition yeah. as his compositional uh strategy and of course minimalism yeah, right so inspired far. by um exactly that approach yeah. and uh would you say that sati also failed because repetition doesn't necessarily uh inspire to ignore music but rather it inspires introspection and re reflection yeah uh, right because maybe that would be argument for what minimalism is meant to be yeah. um and maybe that's why he failed that rather than you know no but it was you know the beginning of it was the um I don't I don't know how to say it in English, but generally when we think about romantic idea of listening, it was, you know, I I I have in mind the Chopin who is playing in Paris Salon, yeah, and everyone is looking at him and they are concentrated on music. So um so this, uh, I, I mean, the, the first decades of the 20th century were actually after this uh, way of listening. So the uh, practice of listening has changed and actually Satie's uh, experiments were before the radio came. I, I think that if Satie, <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, life later, uh, yeah, he, he would, maybe he, will, he would be successful. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Yeah. So, Indeed, a lot of insights. Yeah. I also would have some comments, but we have no time. <laughs> yeah, to I know. Proceed. Okay. I just ah. Okay. I think it's audible more or less. I'm speaking pretty loudly. Just one observation that hearing is very special faculty because mm -hmm. sounds reaches us from everywhere. It's like an ear. We cannot distance. We yeah. like like ears. We can close. We can yeah. turn our gaze yeah. and don't see. But with sound, it's much more difficult. Yeah. Like with smells, it just observes us. Yeah. 
six mm -hmm. and where for it's yeah. as utterly French musicologist and economist I don't know have you read his noise political economy yeah yeah of course also, utterly. yeah yeah he discussed with yeah, faculty yeah. Of hearing and, yeah. and importance in yes. our lives actually. yes that's very complicated and, and I, I think that one one sentence at the end that's why uh, the young generation they just put on the headphones yeah. yeah and they have their own bubble and there is no problem with impulse music but but it's not so easy so when you have audio bubble you also can be manipulated <laughs> for example in the sh in the shop so, yeah, so active listening is somehow already oh we could we, we can say lost yeah because most usual way of listening nowadays is passive listening listening and if some people in some situation experience the moment when we have to listen actively we feel somehow lost we are disappointed. I have experience because if you give to some people who have never experienced contemporary music to listen to that, we, we say, what's that? It's so depressing. What's, <laughs> what, what do you want to tell by that? I, I want some music which which makes me flow, which has certain beat and, and, and things like that, which we are used to. Okay, that's it's time to, yeah. time to stop my comments and <laughs> invite now our guests. I remember his presentation very well from the last year. It's Alastair White from Goldsmith University of London, United Kingdom. His paper, Speaker for the Dead, Composition as Speculative Archaeoacoustics. So, and Alastair, as I understand, he will, will join us. Hello, Robert, yes. can you hear me? Hello, good day, Alastair. Good day, good morning. Nice Hi, everybody. You. Yeah, lovely to see you also. Um, hello, Andres, everybody else. Wonderful. Thank you so much for um, for having me today. And I'm so sorry I can't be there in person, but it's 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 you know it's wonderful to have this format. So thank you so much. Um, uh, Ramudi, shall I just go for it? Are we? What do you think? How is is it all sounding, hear you. sounding it okay? More loud, loud, loudly, but it will be soon fixed. Okay. Ah, okay. It's okay. Wonderful. It's okay. You can can proceed. We hear. Test, test, test. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Um, so uh, can I also share my screen? Is can I put my notes up? Uh, let me see. Uh, how do I do that? Um, They've just updated Zoom, so everything's changed. Uh, let me see. Share screen. Here we go. That's exactly the same as it was. There we go. Okay, so you can uh, see my notes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you again so much. Um. So in this paper today, I'm going to present the foundations for a methodology of composition in which um artistic practice becomes a way of accessing the lost histories of the Paleolithic era. So I'll begin by accepting Graeber and Wengrow's understanding of prehistory as a dazzling tapestry of investigations and inquiries, and from this, critique two modern procedures, one theoretical and one practical, for realising ancient music. Now, this allows us for the proposition of the central axiom of the project that, rather than engage in the poverty of historical reenactment, it is our duty to reimagine, discover and speak for vanished genius. Now, today... I'm only going to be talking about the theoretical background to this in order to prove that it's possible, as well as presenting a short proposal for the finished work itself. So the project's foundational, foundational text is The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and David Wengrow, which uses new anthropological and archaeological evidence to reimagine how we approach the study of prehistory. Now, the importance of this can be seen through a cautionary tale from earlier in the history of the discipline, that of the discovery of Paleolithic cave art in uh, Altamira. Uh, the critic Bruno David impresses the importance of this story of how the art of the cave of Altamira in Spain was found in 1879, depicting this as in itself a legendary encounter that forced us to rethink what we thought we knew about the history of the human mind. He writes how nothing quite like Altamira's cave paintings had been seen before, and neither the general public nor the nascent science of archaeology, only newly informed by the kinds of evolutionary thought propounded by Darwin, were yet prepared to recognise that artistic masterworks could have been made by Paleolithic peoples. 
Indeed, so difficult was it for the discipline to believe that prehistoric society could have produced such sophisticated works of art that the cave's discoverer was ridiculed for having been taken in by uh, what it considered to be so obviously a hoax. Now, perhaps today we might be tempted ourselves to laugh at these 19th century anthropologists with their antiquated notions of human evolution and patronizing superiority to the Paleolithic artist, all of course rooted in notions of human evolution and patronizing uh, and uh, rooted in notions of supremacy and empire. Uh, but that would be to miss the deeper moral of this story, which extends beyond a past society's conception of the Paleolithic as somehow primitive, limited and incapable of excellence. Rather, it's ourselves we should be laughing at, our, our present failure to conceive of the past beyond the givenness of our own contemporary limitations. In fact, in many ways, as the art of caves like the one at Altamira or Chauvet show, they not only equal, but in many ways surpass our own imaginative capabilities. And it's this form of conception that the dawn of everything attempts, albeit with regard most of all to politics. In this text, Graeber and Wengro critique given notions of what they portray as, on the one hand, a Rousseauian fall from grace and innocence, and on the other, a Hobbesian notion of prehistoric life as nasty, brutish and short. The authors maintain that both are wrong. Each of these are limited by the givenness of our own imaginations, rather than the infinite potential of our ancestors, which they're shown to have demonstrated across those uh, hundreds of millennia. So the book's fundamental thesis is this, that from the very beginning, or at least as far back as we can trace such things, human beings were self-consciously experimenting with different social so uh, possibilities. Now, the context of this argument is obviously one of pressing intervention in our own political reality. In many ways, it can be seen as a post-financial crash response to Jameson's famous saying that it's easier to imagine an end of, wor end of the world rather to than to imagine an end to capitalism. In this way, we can contextualize it alongside new materialist theories of infinity, such as those of uh, Quentin Meazou or Alan Badu, the latter of which I intend to deploy at a later point. Crucially, all of these represent attempts at breaking the imaginative deadlock in which all answers become subsumed back into a system of horror and apocalypse that res seemingly resists all intervention. Uh, in this way, the authors asked, what if instead of telling a story about how our species fell from some idyllic state of equality, we ask instead how we came to be trapped in such tight conceptual shackles that we can no longer even imagine the possibility of reinventing ourselves? Far from being our lessers, our ancestors knew things that today we cannot even imagine. More, most importantly for Graeber and Wengro, the ability for a satirical perspective on one's own situation. And so the laughter of the Altamira sceptics thus becomes doubly ironic, not only from ourselves viewing them from the future, but from the lost silent generations of the past who would look on us with the same pity at the shortcomings of what we are able to conceive. The political imperative is not so much that we can believe in their capabilities, but rather learn from them. While all this dictum concerns political organisation, there's no reason why it would not apply to other aspects of Paleolithic knowledge, particularly within the domain of the aesthetic. However, um, while we have evidence of social structures and even paintings, we cannot for the ephemeral arts of music or oral traditions of poetry and drama. In attempting to recapture these, how might we proceed? So the first answer to this comes from a semi-deconstructive reading of another text which straddles the disciplines of archaeology and anthropology, and that's Stephen Mithin's The Singing Neanderthals. Um, in this, I argue this, what's important is the second unstated thesis of the book, perhaps even more important than its primary one, which concerns the use of, and so affirmation of the importance of creativity, emotion, and indeed uh, an aesthetic or even religious feeling of the presence and thus reality of these long vanished individuals. For instance, right at the outset, Mithin argues that one problem with archeology span is its privileging of fact over feeling. And throughout, he's quick to use imagination and emotion as part of the apparatus for his inquiry. Take by way of example, this following passage, where he affirms the use of music therapy in Neanderthal culture. Now, he has absolutely no evidence for this. Uh, this is nothing more than an unsubstantiated flight of fancy. Or is it? Perhaps it's no coincidence that immediately after this, he talks about how in ice age conditions, <clears throat> excuse me, Making decisions was a matter of life and death. In this, he references data from contemporary psychology, which like Catherine Malibu, holds that emotion is a critical component of rationality. 
Now, though Mithin uses this to make the case for Neanderthal culture as a tapestry of intensely felt emotion, there is a subtle implication here in that the text justifies his previous statement that just like Neanderthal hunters, archaeologists too need emotion to make the right interpretation. And this means sometimes venturing beyond the available evidence, in, evidence into the realm of the imaginary. Indeed, Mithin goes so far as to advocate contemporary artworks as windows through which to capture the long lost world of different species of hominids. Most strikingly, I think, that of ballet as a wormhole that could lead back to Neanderthal art. Um, such an approach finally blossoms into a daring wager in the work's final pages, a manifesto for the methodology of the musician rather than that of the archaeologist. Mithin argues that the immediacy of the past is with us always in an encounter both with the biological inheritance of our own bodies and the encounter with the aesthetic that these mediate. Um, now, for a number of reasons uh, we don't have time for today, I think he's ultimately wrong about the body. However, I agree with him entirely regarding the aesthetic, which is ultimately the bearer of the tension between the subjective and the objective, between the inner world and the noumena that act upon it. As such, um, the aesthetic deals always in the overcoming of limitations, whether they be the symbolically mediated body or the impositions of the cynic. Mithin finally concludes with this very beautiful paragraph where he argues that words remain inadequate to describe the nature of music. And so my final words take the form of a request. Listen. Listen to J.S. Bach's Prelude in C Major and think of your ancestors waking in their treetop nests or Dave Brubeck's Unsquare Dance and think of Homo Ergaster stamping, clapping, jumping and twirling. Once you've listened, make your own music and liberate all those hominids that still reside within you. Now, it's significant um, that in all of these, he doesn't refer to re-historical historical reimaginings of prehistoric music, um, and which is what I'll turn to next to show exactly why this might be. In doing so, I want to consider two existing approaches to unearthing the music of the past, one theoretical and one practical, keeping in mind always Graeber and Wenger's assertion that our early ancestors were not just our cognitive equals, but our intellectual peers too. They were perhaps more aware of some things and less aware of others. They were, as Helena Valero said of the Yanomami, just people like us, equally perceptive, equally confused. So to begin with the theoretical, I'm going to look at the paper The Origin of Music and Rhythm by uh, Zubro and Blake. Uh, this can serve to explicate many of the strands of thinking in the discipline of archaeoacoustics, which embodies some of the issues that we've explored already regarding the attempt at connecting with lost cultures. So in this article, I would identify three key issues. Firstly, its use of a concept of origin and, as a consequence, reductive generalizations. And um, one of the key conceits of the paper is that at some point in the Upper Paleolithic, there was a transition from non-music to music, that was accompanied by shifts in intent. Now, the authors argue that the emergence of this music clarifies, uh, or the emergence of music itself clarifies certain methodological issues regarding prehistoric uh, musical practice, writing that definitional and processual questions should be clearer for period, earlier periods because the difference between non existence and existence stands out in stronger contrasts than do differences of degree within the same phenomenon. Contrasts between likely pre-music and post-music can be proposed. Now, Graeber and Wengro are absolutely clear on this, reminding us that such accounts of origin play a similar role today as myth did for the ancient Greeks. Indeed, as Badu attests, there is no origin. And in the words of Graeber and Wengro, there's of course nothing wrong with myths, but such insights can only ever be partial because there was no Garden of Eden and no single Eve ever existed. It is the same with regard to Apollo. Um, the second issue regards the use of this conceit to map contemporary ideas of progress across the imaginary originary divide between intentionality and non-intentionality, between the arbitrary and the causal. Now, uh, there's no reason as to why this might be the case. Um, that, uh, that, that for, The authors uh, provide a schema of pre and post music and that contrasts, for instance, non-constructive perception and non-causal modelling with uh, construction and causal modeling. So uh, from the arbitrary to the causal, basically. And there's, 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 no, there's no reason for, for, for this to be the case other than that, uh, because of the imposition of our own contemporary uh, 21st century ideas. 
Um, uh, for instance, uh, Mithen's model of the origin of language would be diametrically opposed to this. Uh, in his theory, linguistic evolution constitutes a move away from a pre-homo sapien, holistic, mimetic language towards the arbitrary compositional use of discrete units. Uh, music, therefore, might well have been similar, a move from the meaningful imitative causal sound towards the arbitrary use of signification. Um, now, together, these two notions lead to the advocation of historically informed performance. Uh, and the authors argue that in, in attempting to study the origin of music using simulation experimentation or to recreate prehistoric, prehistoric music, real world demonstrations should be created. Now, this is the crux of the argument that contains the previous two problems and constitutes much of the limitations of contemporary archaeoacoustic thinking. For a historically informed performance does not return you to the aesthetic experience. Rather, it bars you from it. There's a reason that Mithen advocates Miles Davis over a reconstruction of Paleolithic music or even modern uh, or even modern hunter gatherer traditions, which show, you know, incredibly striking, uh, striking musical conceits from uh, polyrhythmic uh, to uh, from from pop, uh, polyrhythmic uh, choral polyphony uh, to the, the micro to the 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 the, uh, the multiphonics of, of of Inuit throat singing. Um, so in this way, indeed, the, the critic Mark Berry has noted how elective authenticist positivism concentrates on a few facts, uh, facts in themselves, to emphasize their one-sided objectivism. The selectivity is crucial here. In this, many facts are excluded, especially those that might lead one beyond in itselfness. We can see this in the same way that the limitations of our own imaginations that Graeber and Wenger identified are not overcome, but rather become embedded with a type of itself historically contingent instrumental reason. And we're further than ever from locating the true source that we seek. So these ideas um, can be shown to manifest similarly in practical attempts at reimagining Paleolithic music. Uh, for this, as a case study, I'll refer to um, Anna, Poten uh, Anna Potengovsky and George Veland's fascinating, really you know, wonderful project, The Edge of Time. Um, in this, it uses reconstructions of instruments such as bone flutes to reimagine uh, the music of the Paleolithic era. Now, as fascinating and as you know, magnificent as this music is, and as much as the musicians must be respected for what they've achieved with these instruments, um, the end result nevertheless embodies much of the thinking outlined in the article that we looked at previously. That is, it exists within the realm of historical reenactment by firstly taking a primitivist appropriation of the natural as an uninterrogated signifier, and secondly, the imposition of contemporary limits upon prehistoric infinities, which align with the mapping of Zubrow and Blake that we looked at previously. The music is characterized uh, throughout by a peculiarly modern thinking with familiar notions of gesture, development and tonality, which includes both centers and their modulation, as well as the use of similarly familiar textures, textures such as regular ostinati and arpeggios. Um, much of it sounds not so far off from Beethoven. Indeed, there is a shock in listening to the album when halfway through they perform a piece by Cage and like Mithin suggested, it begins to sound much more like prehistoric music than any of the historically informed performance practice. Um, it's only what what what's troubling about this is we know it wouldn't have to be the case. As I mentioned before, hunter gatherer music today shows an imagination that entirely outstrips this. But it's only when we compare this to the surviving art of Paleolithic peoples that we can see the shortcoming of such an approach. Um, because ultimately, the true case against projects such as this is paleo is Paleolithic art itself, such as that of the Chauvet Cave, um, which I've got a, an example of here. It's absolutely amazing. Um, uh, but what, why would this be the case? Well, in the liner notes, the musicians argue that their practice was informed by the fact that most of the possibilities present would have been available for people 40,000 years ago too. In doing so, that is in constructing limits rather than infinities, the, music, the musicians have created the general, whereas the, whereas the cave, such as um, this panel of the rhinoceros, is exceptional. This is the problem. It's easier to create a general music, impossible, to imagine the specificity of genius and insight. That is, of course, unless we invert our understanding of these parameters and see, as Badu claims, truth as that which is infinite and generic. For instance, here in the Chauvet Cave, there is this remarkable panel, the panel of the rhinos, which, which uses this incredible use of movement and line, what Werner Herzog has called a type of proto-cinema, and which reaches through the static voluminous horses of the art in between to the 20th century. For instance, um, 
uh, for instance, this painting, um, Dynamism of a Dog on a Leash by Giacomo Balla, painted in 1912, made possible, we thought, only through the advent of the camera. Um, what I'd argue is that without these paintings, if we attempted to reconstruct them via the procedures of uh, Potingovsky and Wieland or Zubro and Blake, we would not be able to imagine it. It would seem ludicrous. It would be lost. The exceptional exists beyond the general. In this way, the laughter of the anthropologists at Altamira is still alive in archaeology. It's the poverty of imagination that is historical reenactment. Um, instead, we must speak for the dead and re recapture the vanished genius of the composers of the past, who I have no doubt were as daring and remarkable as those that dreamed the, the rhinoceros of the Chauvet cave. But how would one affect such a communication backwards in time across unimaginable millennia? We're fortunate in that the proof of Paleolithic genius is not all that the Chauvet cave provides us with. For through the work of Alan Badu, we're also given access to what the philosopher has called the meta-history of invariant truths, of which both the cave and its surviving modernist counterparts partake in. The crucially non-causal nature of such a relation offers the possibility to move backwards in time from the artworks we have access to, to those we have lost. So at the beginning of his book, Logics of Worlds, Badu claims that natural inculcated thought of our own time is the conviction that he names democratic materialism, the affirmation that there are only bodies and languages. To this, he counters his own materialist dialectic, the assertion that there are only bodies and languages except that there are truths. And regarding the existence of truths, he holds that it is merely a question of describing through the mediation of some examples, the sufficient effect of truths to the extent that once they have appeared, they compose an atemporal meta-history. He gives examples in each uh, domain of his four truth processes of love, science, politics, and art, but today it's only the latter that concerns this. In this, Badu draws a comparison between two panels of the Chauvet cave and two works of Picasso to show the non-causal emergence of an eternal truth in all four paintings. Fundamental to this argument is the absolute difference of the subject matter itself. The horse of the hunter-gatherer is entirely removed from that of the modernist painter. It is not the subject matter, but rather the invariant theme, the eternal truth that they deploy, which unites them. Badu contends that this invariance constitutes the following idea, that the animal as type or name is a clear cut in the formless continuity of sensorial experience. It brings together a flagrant organic unity with the always recognizable character of its specific form. This means that, as in the Platonic myth, but in reverse, to paint an animal on the wall of the cave is to flee the cave so as to ascend towards the light of an idea. Um, the emergence of this invariance occurs within the artistic practice, practice itself, crucially in the technical consequences of the painting, the effect of which is that of the primacy of the line as a cut in the flow of experience. And it's this same idea that Boudou recognises in the Chauvet Caves panel of the horses. Together, these images affirm the eternal truth that in painting, the animal is the occasion to signal through the certainty of the line alone that that between the idea and existence, between the type and the case, I can create and therefore think the point that remains indeterminable. Thus, despite the objective difference of the material horses captured by these painters, their representation converges them upon the same animal, the idea of the horse. Badu therefore proposes the following axiom for the meta-history of truths, culminating in, uh, in the dictum that truth is both infinite and generic. It is a radical exception as well as an elevation of anonymous existence to the idea. Now, Due to the non-causal relation of such a meta-history, one should not see Picasso as an effect of the Chauvet cave, um, but rather both as consequences of the truth of the nature of representation and the platonic idea. Thus, even in the absence of the cave, it would be possible to reconstruct a version of its art through the truth of Picasso alone. We must, we may they, we may, we may thus combine Mithin's unconscious methodology with Badu's meta-historical topography to propose an alternative to the archaeoacoustics of the day. That it is not from a, the general that we should proceed, i.e. bodies and languages, but from their exception, that is, truths. So what would constitute a similar procedure in music? Um, Badu names Schoenberg as an event later in the book, and Berg and Webern within this as the local antinomy that constitutes the truth of this. Um, so we can stick with this area, though I draw different conclusions from Badu. 
Instead, following Richard Kurth, I would read the Schoenberg event as the conception of Hegelian Aufhebung, a suspension rather than synthesis. This suspension, where tonality is not negated, but rather hangs as a latent possibility through the tension between subjective negation and the weight of history, is the modernist insight into the invariant truth of paradox, that two mutually exclusive things may coexist and indeed contain one another. Um, we might, uh, um, so having grasped this, how would one use it to reanimate the lost work of the Paleolithic composer? How would one move from the generosity of exception to its appearing in the world? Well, I would justify this with two final contextualizations. Firstly, as an act of theory fiction in the tradition of Cyclonopedia by Negrostani and the CCRU. And secondly, as a work of science fiction, as proposed by novels such as Always Coming Home and Speaker for the Dead. That is a fiction of the sun sciences, such as anthropology and archaeology, rather than, say, physics or technology. And so my proposal takes the form of the following sketch. As a musician, as an upper Paleolithic composer, grappling with the internalization of music from the group to the individual, from the external to the internal world. I would support this with a justifiable historical context in which their art takes place within the culture of an arbitrary language and symbolic intent, complete with an art of religious significance where an object can stand for something else. The composer's lost enactment of the truth of paradox is to draw music from within these domains, that is from the domain of group practice to that of individual contemplation, or in another language, from the domain of the hymn to the domain of the relic. In these, I deploy the paradoxes of, firstly, plurality and imminence, which concerns the one and the many, um, and secondly, the paradox of atmosphere and integrality, a rethinking of the causal relation between the centre and the periphery. And the technical realization of these, I propose the truth of the symbolic as a means of ways to overcome the limits of the individual. Now, while for Schoenberg it was a score, for our upper Paleolithic composer, it would be the creation of an internal landscape that functions as a multidimensional world of informa information. In this, the presence of nature is not imitated, but like both the cave art, the music of modern hunter-gatherers, Picasso, Schoenberg, and so on, its transformation into the symbolic is necessary for the intervention into that same world of which the artist is part. Nature, not as object to be in and imitated, but as a speaking subject. That is, rather than the primitive imitative, imitativeness proposed by other attempts, the composer would have seen the landscape as a rich symbolic heritage, a text, as the master of the Chauvet cave understood the horse was also the idea of the horse. In this, the landscape can be used to hold and organize conflicting impulses and so recognize, reconcile them. Thus, distance and perspectives and viewing objects might have an effect upon the musical realization, implying a rich polyphony of material that seeks to explore the heart of music that is the paradox between the individual and the group, an invariant truth of the human between freedom and organization, one that today, as Grieber and Wenger realized, is as pressing to us as ever. Thank you. Thank you, Alastair, for your inspiring presentation. Indeed. Thank you. It inspires well. to somehow even change thinking, thinking about how we compose and maybe may open even a new way of looking to our practices. So, and now it's time for comments and, and questions from the public, please. Milos, you always have something to say. <laughs> um, perhaps that's a, that's a bit uh, too much content to for for my capacities to 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 digest in 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 so short a time. Uh, so I would actually uh, ask a very simple question. Uh, since you're referring to really a wide range of references, uh, how come you never mentioned in this context Gary Tomlinson? I think his two studies on uh, um, the origin of music, the origin of human modernity are actually the most exciting things I ever read about that. Uh, just Curious, do, do you have any perspective on that? 
Wonderful. I, thank you so much, Milos. And hello uh, again. Um, thank you for that comment. No, I, I've not come across. Uh, I've not come across that work uh, as of yet. I will. I will look into it. Uh, Gary Tomlinson, you say. Yeah, and uh, also uh, last year it appeared uh, Mike Spitzer who uh, wrote something, um, the musical human. That's the the title of his book. Mike Spencer, thank very you very much. much in in accordance with what you are saying. I think that really they they give a tremendous support to to great many things that you said today. Wonderful, I very much appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I will. I will look into that. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think we we all have some some ideas and some comments about this presentation because indeed some Neanderthalians are still uh, alive in us and we <laughs> we can sense it is also very much with presentation in spirit of Delosian Watari considerations I think so but we have to proceed because time is going and we have to invite our next speaker and it will be online presentation and as, as far as i see it's manuel salas from academy of music in bitgosht poland and he will he will speak about graphicacy imagining cre creating and interpreting a musical work through images so manuel we are looking forward for your presentation. Please, let's try where everything works. Yes. <clears throat> Hello. Thank you very much. I first, if you can listen to me clearly. If you can listen to me. Everything yes, it's, is... it's everything all right. Everything all right. So you can see my also my screen. Yes. Sorry. Well, thank you very much for for this opportunity to present part of my my work, my vision related with uh, communication, graphicacy, and of course, music composition. In my paper, I will present first in the first part to try to go to the concept of abduction presented by Charles Peirce. And later I will move on to the idea of drawing already musical works from Shenakis and Julio Strada. So, why let's let's start so <clears throat> abduction as the third method for scientific reasoning was studied by math mathematician and philosopher charles Peirce. for the american philosopher the genesis of hypothesis and new ideas in science hypothesis comes from the operation not of induction nor for nor of deduction but of abduction Peirce considered abduction reasoning as the method par excellence of scientific discovery Departing from the foundation of scientific discovery, which is systematic obs observation and experimentation, we, we can highlight four basic elements which peers consider decisive in order to obtain hy a hypothe hypothesis, imagination, drawing, visual thinking, and synthetic typology, topology. When these elements are placed in a musical context, then objective reasoning could lead us into a new model for musical creation. Christoph Pechlivandinis, in his article, What is Behind the Logic of Scientific Discovery, Aristotle and Charles Peirce, provides an explanation, according to Peirce, of how imagination is conceived as a natural exercise of the mind that follows an abduction, abduction approach, where in the search for a hypothesis, quote, the scientist uses her creativity imagination, makes assumptions or suppositions, exercised through experiments, tries, tries to alternative solutions to imaginary problems, close quote. In parallel with Peirce's approach to imagination, Perlibanidis identifies two methods which the scientist, scientist applies in order to exploit their own imaginary reasoning based on abduction, which are reasoning with, quote, which are reasoning with diagrams and reasoning with experiments, close quote. But still the question remains why this is so important for musical creation. Musical imagination, in, the, in this context is the ability to project sound objects by means of imaginary reasoning based on acoustic phenomena, which involves different areas of subjective and objective reasoning, 
The musical imagination is composed of sound objects, which do not involve solely the auditory field of the brain. On the contrary, they interact with other sense in the process of creation. What determines the capacity of each individual to encode the information perceived is the level of intellectual knowledge of the musical matter in conjunction, conjunction with the physical basis of the sound that can be manifested by a physical phenomena. Graphicazi. Once we dive deep into the search that Peirce carried out on the abductive reasoning and its relationship with the cognitive science, it could lead us, us to consider drawing as an essential tool for artists who are involved, not involved strictly in visual arts, such as a musical composer in this case. Simon, Simon Simons III, in his article entitled Charles Peirce on the teaching of drawing claims that, that implications for teaching drawing under Peirce's approach into abductive reasoning could lead us to, quote, restore drawing to its former place at the Center for Professional Preparation School of Art, as well to reestablish its role as an essential aspect of graphicacy in general abduction, close quote. Seymour's investigations on Peirce's theory are based on the close relationship that exists between drawing and thinking from fields of cognitive science as well as in pedagogy. In this last envelope, the author highlights the term graphicacy, which refers to, quote, the ability to combine or interpret spatial information not easily communicated in words or numbers. Graphicacy then applies to drawing of all types, such as sketches, illustration diagrams, graphs, art, architecture plans, etc. This also could include computer graphics and photography. The practice of drawing during the second half of the 20th century directly influenced the process of creating music, achieve a more spontaneous way of communicating the environment of the imaginary with the reality of the acoustic phenomena. The manner by which it is possible to communicate what is imagined in, the, in reality is through graphics, which activates both auditory and visual perception. Creating a draw can be compared with the creation of a graphic representation of music created in the composer's imagination. This peculiar fact directly indicates the need to use drawing as one of the fundamental ontological figures of our musical work. It is worth noting that this problem is addressed by philosopher Kathleen Hull in, his, in the article entitled The Iconic Purse, in which she writes that a group of scientists from the Netherlands calls the, this phenomenon Beldenken, pictorial thinking. Hull explains that them as follows, quote, research Maria Krebb noticed that people who think in image do not use language and see answers to giving problems in an intuitive way, close quote. But the question rises, does graphicacy or visual thinking could lead us on, could lead us into new theories for what musical creation concerns? Looking backwards during the second half of the 17th century, Ian Ishinakis proposed perhaps the most and most, the first and most innovative method for electroacoustic musical creation using drawings as, for, as a form of immediate representation of continuous musical fantasies. One example of this is also the creation of the UPIC system. Reviving a little history of graphicas in the music, Shinakis in, uh, in the early 50s with his first orchestra wars metastasis for orchestra and Pitok Prakta, the graphic notation brought something completely new for musical composition with new textures of mass sounds that were not ever conceived before. The origin of this methodology can be found in his book, Formalized, Thought, Formalized Music, Thought and Mathematics in Composition, published in 1963, where the author presented one of the most relevant questions for what concerns music composing in the 20th century. In how many ways can we feel a square? This marking the beginning of visual thinking as a form of graphicacy which is not codified under a traditional musical language, but as a free way of communicating the impression of an acoustic phenomena, which is analogically represented under an abstract design made by opposite vertical lines, corpse, circles, and so on, as we can see on the, on the left on the left image. So as we can notice on, uh, on, on the next side, we also have squares. This time, uh, these scores are fulfilled, but with texture, which are not only visual, but acoustic, or in better words, audiovisual, audiovisual squares or diagrams. Here we have the musical score from 
those um, from those uh, compositions. From the from the image, we can uh, ask to ourselves how important it is to know what occurs in each of these lines. The answer is that it's not important. The importance of this course arises when we observe it as a whole, as a space filled with glissandis and brief sounds. The same situation occurs with metastasis at the beginning and at the end of the composition, where all the musical texture, texture is fulfilled by glissandis moving in opposite directions or are still, as in the beginning of the piece. The great value lies in the foundation of Shenakti's concept, which is which according to Julio Estrada, is based on the visual thinking of an architect and not strictly on musical reasoning, as Estrada declares. Shenaki's uh, quote, Shenaki's thought can be understood that through the graphics, it is possible to hear what you can possibly see on a wall, close quote. Following Estrada's assumption on the Greek composer, we could understand that in fact, Shenaki did not think in musical terms, but rather in architectonical terms where the intention was the need to communicate some kind of visual abstract image that could be re represented with, within graphicacy, and this transposed into a musical score. It is important to notice that in this, in Shenaki's book, uh, Formalized Music, the author focused primarily other um, methods, but primarily he focused on the mathematical process for musical compositions. However, it seems to reveal that the most important legacy lies on the importance to apply graphicacy in order to com communicate visual imaginary with some phenomena. Is this where we might wonder if music is a science like mathematics or music is a language? It could be a language when the methodology and system used for its creation like process, um, sorry, could be a language to the extent that it's codified in a traditional system but music cannot be treated as a language when the methodology and system and the system used for its creation lie precisely in graphicacy, a system that as a person understand, it is the way, is the best way of self-communication. That is to represent their ideas, their ideas, but not their words. And the question rises, what was Shinakis trying to communicate in order to search for, for a possible answer? Let's look at Shinaki's statement regarding the creation of um, the creation of metant, metastasis. Metastasis, the starting point of my life as a composer, was inspired not by music, but rather by the impressions gained during the Nazi occupation of Greece. Uh, the Germans tried to take the Greek workers to the Third Reich, and we staged huge demonstrations against these and managed to prevent it. I listened to the sound of the masses marching towards the center of Athens, the shouting of slogans, and then when they came up, Nazis tanks, the intermittent in, shooting of the machine guns, the chaos. I should never forget the transformation of the regular rhythmic noise of hundred thousand of people into fant some fantastic disorder." Close quote. Perhaps this way, of creating music allowed him to recover what he lost during the explosion of the grenade on the left side of his face, using hearing and visual sense. Through the elaboration of image, Shenakis Shenaki could recover what he could no longer have at the same time, to represent what was kept in his memory since the shouting and chaos and also the explosion. This is a fundamental aspect of the Shenakian drama. Graphicacy then allows the imagination to be free, stimulating uh, abductive reasoning in order to discover new ways of organizing musical material. Jupic system in Shenakis uh, synthesized the process of free musical creation using an immediate sound graphic methodology through which the barrier of mathematical collation was eliminated and the creator's intuition was integrated in a, in a more spontaneous way. Since its creation, the UPIC materialized a central aspect of Shinakin thought, the analogical representation of sounds by means of two-dimensional graph. This principle shows through the UPIC a use of technology that is useful for musical creation as well as for its purpose in pedag pedagogical fields. From a pedagogical perspective, UPIC allows not only professional musicians, but anyone who wishes to experience the spontaneous creations of a musical structure simply by freely drawing any designs that arise from their intuition. Consistent with peers' assumptions regarding drawing as a part of abducting reasoning, 
Shanaki's approach to musical creations provides similar results when he discovered that, quote, not only architecture, but also music can emerge from precisely recorded designs, lines on the drawing surface as pictures of sustained or moving tones in the tonal space. In this way, abductive reasoning is active through drawing, making possible to connect intuition with musical creativity. And as a result, the musical structures would emerge from the specific type of creation would be impossible to obtain if we're taking a, in consideration only from a traditional graphical representation methodology, strictly musical writing. In the following statement, Shinakis provides a clear explanation for what concerns graphicasi in a musical in musical creation and how by these methods a new way of communication can be approached. Quote, if you draw lines on a blackboard, you can create sounds and music, not just sounds, but also developments of rather complex sounds, that is to say, of music. And Troy is the inability of every human with a hand and a brain. The hand is the origin closest to the brain. Giving everyone the opportunity to compose music leads to a double result. On the one hand, you make the creativity active, available to everyone, and on the other hand, on the hand there is no longer the abyss between any avant-garde and the rest of the audience. Rather, it is about building bridge and be, being able to think music, meaning creating music with everything that comes with it. For everyone from the age when the child can hold a pencil and listen to adulthood and until death." Close quote. Shenaki's methodology confirms without this being the foundation of his thesis, that abducting reasoning is the process of musical composition can be increased through drawing, resulting in a new form for, of communication between the creator and the receptor of any musical work. As Shenakis mentioned above, there is no longer this abyss between the music and the rest of the ad, ad, audience. Jupik in Strada's music. It was a point of departure in a path for spontaneous musical creation based on a graphical musical reasoning. Nevertheless, as an electronic system, it contains a line that is difficult to cross if the desire of the composer is to achieve a high resolution of the musical imagination into reality. Julio Strada, back in the year 1980, got in contact with the Jupix system. Strada intentions to approach and compose his first and only electroacoustic work, Ewa On, was entirely an experimental form using draw as the medium for spontaneously linking the musical reasoning with the imagina imagination. In his own words, he describes his experience at his follow. My intention was to observe the link between the dynamic and physical potentials through the inflections given to the, draw to the drawing within the continuous medium and, the cre and to create, with massive transformations, a texture that evokes the mental environment of the imaginary." Close quote. I will try to just let me know if you can listen. You can listen the audio. Audio or is it just in my computer? Uh, it's okay. We hear through ah, the loudspeaker. Perfect, perfect. Because sometimes uh, it doesn't. Fair, thank you. So we heard uh, the uh, symphonic orchestra version because the electronic version was lost by some worker at the UPIC center, unfortunately. But we there's still the, the graphic of the original work. Let's move on. Sorry. So, imagination in Julio Strada's philosophy of musical creation. In his doctoral dissertation, Julio Strada presented his philosophical, philosophical postulates concerning musical creation, taking as one of the main fundamentals the relation between reality and imagination in the process of creation. In order to connect imagination with reality in the act of musical creation, Strada determinates different forms of experimentation which involve manual practice that allow him to express the trajectories of sound in his imagination through drawings, bodily movements, or onomatopoeic evocations. For, 
For that, he proposed two forms in which his musical perception is manifested into physical auditory phenomena, the verbalization of the sound and the chronography, a graphic representation of the sound. Communication between musical irrationality and rationality. Strada emphasized the importance of a dialogue between two factors, musical irrationality, the source of which is imagination and auditory perception, and musical rationality, its source, of, it is the acoustic reality. The study of this process makes it possible to base a new musical reasoning based on the relationship that developed between auditory perception and empirical reasoning, which is why Strada proposed the subject of the study to make three components, mental atmosphere, it defines this aspect of the imagination with the help of the human instinct, recognizing phonetic structures with different levels of expression and the associated, associated sense of the height of musical object. Perso perceptual tendencies. Music is created by combining imaginary musical content with the process of rational organization of musical material. Given that each composer made use of the both possibilities in different ways, the results are endless. Movement, the impressions related to the perception of movement coming from the musical imagination allow us to obtain a bit more objective descriptions of this process. Strada distinguished two views that requires consideration in the philosophical foundations of his theory. The first is aimed to, at examining all musical material that can be, can be organized and the structure based on empirical reasoning, involving deductive and inductive reasoning. The second, it examines, examines the, everything that is figment or of the imagination and that can be, can be explained by abduction. The combination of these two types of reasoning forms, the basis on which he established his philosophy of theory of composition, and he explained in a dynamic interaction, where the composer not only takes into account the external factors influencing musical creativity, but also recognizes the importance of internal factors in the creative process. He proposed to extend the traditional idea of composition to the theory of musical creativity through a dynamic interaction consisting of five different levels where reality is linking to the universe of imagination. Reality is composed of two basic elements, musical matter, rhythm, and sound. Theory, the study of basic psychoacoustic mathematical or other organization of musical matter. System, design representative models of individual or collective choices from a theoretical base. Style, characteristics determined by individual creativity and use of each system and imagination. It marks the field of intuition, fantasies, perception, memories, or the construction of a creative and phenomenal universe of music. Based on this dynamic interaction, Strada developed a twofold methodology. The one referring to reality, the so-called macro timbre, the synthesis of rhythm and sound that leads to the chronoacoustic fusion of musical matter. Macro timbre then becomes the place where the musical perception is integrated by all the physical variables of sound. It means frequency, amplitude, and harmonic content. The, the second one, the one referring to the imaginary, corresponds to a chronographical methodology based on drawing the movement of the sound. By doing so, Estrada became able to detail with the highest degree of resolution all qualities of sound that are manifested firstly in the imaginary. Drawing as a graphic from of what has been generated by creative fantasy is one of the main pillars for Strada in order to create musical, a musical work. The composer declares the need to draw these original music ideas as follows. Quote, everything I hear I must, everything I hear must first be drawn and then transformed into a musical notation. Close quote. This key moment, the act of drawing, revolutionized the whole approach to musical creation. It allowed for a spontaneous and less rigorous consolidation of the movement of rhythm, sound, and noise components in the micro timbre. After almost 10 years of manual experimentations, Strada created a musical program called Ewa Olin System. It allowed him to refine the method of conversion for any musical object in a three-dimensional space. It, um, this, process, this procedure helped him to obtain more sophisticated data of the musical material as the composer explains. Quote, the practice of graphically recording three-dimensional trajectories requires a highly developed ear in order to capture the immense amount of data inherent in musical materials. A multi-dimensional chronoacoustic graphical trajectory 
Canana allow one to obtain a variety of inflections simultaneously occurring on, a, on several layers, close quote. The method of confection is explained in four steps as follows. Chronographical recording, an accurate, accurate copy of any musical material, the assigning of a series of reference scales to chosen parameters in order to obtain a conversion of chronographical data, a series of alternatives for transcribing data into a multidimensional music score, and a musical performance that is a new version of the original material based on the resulting score. As an example, I would like to present the composition you know who you know who ejectl which is one of the series of the juno hui the first series juno hui j for cello solo this time the composer applies a rigorous method to translate each one of the trajectories of the macro timbre by the year of 2022 it exists a total of 10 series of the juno hui all based on the original draw i would like to exemplify the functionality of drawing with this series juno hui ejectl what the scores used by the performance has to be has to be drawn by each one of them. In this series, the composers gave the instrumentalists completely freedom in order to create their own combination of the components of rhythm, sound, noise. What we see on the screen is just uh, the beginning of the whole draw, which is quite quite long, a few meters. But here I would like to present the original, uh, like the transposition of the draw for all the components included in the partitur. And from this partitur, each of the instrumentalists which will, which will prepare the composition will have to choose which of these whole section of 15 parameters, they, they must choose five from them. And from there, they start to choose to elaborate their own partitur. In this case, many of them choose to apply a partitur made by drums, like uh, we can see here on the, on the next example. Here we can see the partitur made by Andrei Wojciechowski. Is the partitur he, he present? He prepared for a concert playing by uh, playing this specific composition, and we can hear a little example from. Mm -hmm. In the case of the described drawing practice of Strada, it must be stated, however, that it has no connection with the linguistic cognitive problems presented by Kreb and Hull. In Strada's process of creation, thinking with pictures is related with the mental atmosphere in which the sounds perceived graphically are the product of the relationships between the imagined and the visual sound. They are derived of cognitive activities that work simultaneously without the need to use any verbal expression. The composer explains as follows, quote, Drawing allows me to stimulate my musical creativity through the intuition of the rhythm sound movement in the continuum without involving any verbal form, close quote. As what explained above, Peirce's observations regarding visual thinking do not concern sound as a form of visual in, visualizing a structure in a three-dimensional space. However, Kathleen Hull explains that Peirce came to understand appreciate and finally to explore the riches of visual perceptions and use in geometric for the seek of a deeper understanding of all human reasoning. Considering first hypothesis for what visual thinking and imagination concerned, it's possible to search a connection between visual thinking with sound thinking applying topological variations. Here, abducting reasoning involves simultaneously an imaginary three-dimensional image of a sound structure and a graphical structure of the sound in movement. In Persian terms, topological variations are most studied in the fields of mathematics. Kathleen Hull explains that Peirce's classifications of topology is understood, quote, as the foundation of all geometry, 
Topology may be described as the study of properties of geometry objects that do not change when continuous stretching and bending of the object, object into new space is performed. Close quote. In I modern synthetic... Manuel, but if you can already come to conclusions, because we, we already have very little time. Uh, yes, sorry. Well, I want just to show uh, the topological exploration of strata, which is made mainly by um, this, um, based on the transformations of three-dimensional uh, image, image, which is used by, as was expl explained it a few seconds before. I wanted to explain, uh, to show, uh, also to to put as example, musical example of the Ishinioni string quartet, but this apply all the, this methodology of topologic uh, transformations. This is my uh, schema of all the segment H of such quartet, where uh, uh, is presented in a B-dimensional space, uh, the transformation of only the, 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 the pitches, but not of the rest of the components. So we can see how topologic uh, variations are applied in Estrada's composition. Okay, I will jump this one. And just as a conclusion, the type of reasoning presented in Shinaki's methodology and Strada's musical workshops connections with abductive reasoning, the essence of which was explained in Charles Pierce's writings. Also, the Greek and Mexican composers were unfamiliar with the American philosophy, philosopher's theory. They apply similar type of reasoning, where in their statements, both artists emphasize the importance of the creative role of the mind as an important element of creativity, which can be stimulated by both subjective inspiration and objective influence factors. In both cases, Peirce's theories regarding scientific reasoning, together with implication of graphicacy, are presented in a similar way for what graphicacy means, but presenting in each case an independent value for what concerns the form of communicating the musical world. In the one hand, Shinakis, it breaks the barrier that exists between the receiver and the creator, active musical thought and free and more spontaneous process. And on the second hand, Strata Graphicasis communicates the reality and the imagination of the sound phenomena in the act of musical creation with a high resolution of the components of rhythm sound. So this is my last uh, quote for what to remember what is abduction in Peirce terms, the biography. Thank, Thank you, you for, Manuel. I'm, I'm for sorry your very much. Presentation. For time. Thank you. I'm sorry for to cover a bit more of time. Sorry very much. Yes, and since we are already over the time schedule, we have some time for one question or comment. So if somebody from from the audience would like to comment. Yes, please. Thank you very much for interesting paper. I have actually two comments. One, um, maybe it's a question, it's a comment. Do you think that um, there is some, is there any um, common features between uh, Julio Estrada's concept and for example, sonic visualizer? Because as a musicologist, I have, some associations with the programs that are used to analyze music. So it's also, it's a kind of spectrogram. You can create this uh, kind of, you know, diagrams. Mm -hmm. And are there any common things, do you think? Do you know uh, this program, uh, Sonic Visualizer uh, is? Thank you very much. Yes, I know the I know the program. I have been working with it. Well, the the connections that I find is are, is very interesting because I treat uh, as I start to learn about macro timbre, the, this chrono chronographical process and chronoacoustic, then I to, I start to understand it as a his own program of transposing the imaginary in some in a, the imaginary in a visual context. It means exactly what it does the sonic visualizer. It, the macro timbre requires that each one of us, without the use of technology, just by the use of our imagination, we can create a, a draw and with implying many draws, many lines and curves and, and glissandis, or as you can interpret it, you must, gener you must classify which component of the sound is, is an, a specific line as is does the sonic visualizer. Yes, you can, you can observe the, the pitches or the, or the dynamics or the space 
in the same context, it works the macro timbre. So uh, this is a more difficult program to apply because it's only used by your imagination and how much the the person that is applying macro timbre knows about the music he's creating in his own imagination, how he will transform this into an acoustic sound without the use of any technological uh, um, technological features. So in this context, there are there is connection, but uh, never uh, Strada was influenced by some uh, programs like this, other than the Jupic, because we can see that the Jupic was the point of the part to, in Strada to apply in drawings, uh, strictly drawings, and to observe the draw, how it start to create the sound. Yes, it was only that as the an ele electronic device. And from there, he started to create his own draws, manual draws, and then he created his, his own program. But um, I think there are these uh, connections between how the sonic visualizer as a program work and how the macro timbre and chrono chronographical works in Strada's conception. Yes. Thank you. Indeed to our last presentation of this morning session and I would like to invite and I already see our colleague Rados Mitrovic right from University of Belgrade and his presentation is listening is a performative act a case study of David Helbig please Rados can you hear us can we hear you let's, yeah, let's see yes I can hear you can you hear me yes 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 okay. Prop great great uh, well, good morning to everyone, uh, especially <laughs> greetings to my distinguished professor Milos Zlatkalik, who is there with you. Uh, and I will present a paper, as you said, listening is a performative act, case study of David, uh, David uh, Helbig. Uh, key for the poetic direction of the German composer David Helbig are the questions of the relationship between sound and space and recipient and performer. This is an artist whose creativity is based on the concept as the foundation of artistic expression. This concept is most commonly related to the artistic need to establish an autonomous world within which different sound tests can be conducted with the aim of researching divergent sound sensation, but also questioning the limits of the sound art. In this sense, Helbig does not belong to those sound artists who use sound as just one of their artistic means, because the sound represents both his starting and ending point. It should be noted that he studied composition in Amsterdam in Freiburg and that he, as stated in his biography, is a regular composition teacher at the summer cur courses for new music in Darmstadt. I stress this fact because I believe it is important for understanding the basic poetic positions of the artist I want to outline. His works range from regular scores to what we could call conceptual games, which will be the focus of this paper. I will start from what he considered his program poem, as presented in the text, listening is a performative act. Uh, here Helbig says, music takes place between the ears, music takes place between the people, music is a social space, music is a concept, it cannot be non-conceptual, noise can be heard as music, music can be heard as noise, listening is a performative act. Therefore music is for Helbig a concept in itself, it is a set of sounds that the recipient perceives as something called music, which exists exclusively in the interpersonal interaction between creators and recipients. In a sense, he is following the tradition of John Cage when in a large number of works, he uh, affirms the idea of music as omnipresent, as sounds that surround us, and which he as a composer tries to bring to, uh, to awareness in the listeners. This is how John Cage described the meaning of writing music in his text as experimental music. Uh, one is, of course, not dealing with purposes, uh, I quote, but dealing with sounds, or the answer must take uh, the form of paradox, a uh, purposeful purposefulness or a purposeless play. This play, however, is an affirmation of life, not an attempt to bring order out of chaos, nor to suggest improvements in creation, but simply a way of waking up to the very life we're living, which is so excellent once uh, one get, gets one's mind and one's desires out of its way and uh, let it act of its own uh, accord." Uh, end of quote. In the same vein, 
Helbig poetics is based on this way of thinking about music that led him to innovative forms of expression. The artist introduces special terminology to denote certain creative practices. I will mention works labeled as sound walks, earpieces, and interactive sound meditation. Sound walks are pieces based on the idea of combining recorded soundscape tapes and listening to urban spaces. The participants in the project listen to a recorded tape of selected soundscape sounds using semi-open headphones that allow for external sounds to be received as well, and they are given the task of moving along a fixed route, whereby the sounds of the surrounding space are mixed with the recorded ones. Examples are Kortjark or Maastricht tracks. Describing Maastricht, Helbig notes, I quote, this book, along with 11 soundtracks, takes you on a trip to some very special places in the middle of the city, invisible to most visitors but less than an arm's length away. A trip to the parallel universe of sensations and imagination, contemplative in some parts, absurd in others. Maastricht tracks consist of sound compositions and instructions which are divided between the book and the audio files. With the help of your participation, the work will come to life and start to actually exist your performer and the audience at the same time. Mm -hmm. The composer further explains his idea behind this concept. Maastricht tracks approaches sens sensory perception as a performative act. It emphasizes the impact we can have on our own auditory, visual, or physical experiences, not only by being active, but also imaginative. We can perform hearing, we can play seeing, and we can act feeling, end of quote. So the point is to intensify the auditory perception of the participants and to establish often conflicting correlation between the primary auditory stimulus generated through headphones and the secondary one that is looming, which together draw the listener into complex and confusing perceptual relationship with the reality that surrounds them. This reality is in turn connected to the urban space and moving through it is a carefully programmed by a kind of movement score that is <clears throat> pardon, that is map. As Helbig further states, I quote, each of the pieces focuses on a different relationship between you, me, and the city. You, the performer and audience, me, the artist, and the city, our environment. In a mix of actions and contemplation, the potential of headphones, both their technology and their social connotations, is channeled into various setups, some of which are fully fledged listening pieces, others not at all. Maastricht tracks in its entirety stands for a kind of manifesto of instructional performance and sound art, end of quote. We can tie this to something that Professor Mirena Veselinovich Hoffman calls contextual art, the one cage inaugurates in four minutes, uh, 33 seconds, in which the composition is directly built by the sound context. However, the very idea of moving through, the, through an urban space as a place for the event relates to the tradition of derive, which was developed by letrists. Uh, as Guy Debord notes, these practices are a technique of rapid passage through varied ambiences. Derive involve playful constructive behavior and awareness of uh, psychogeographical effects and are thus quite different from the classic notions of journey or stroll. Helbig transgresses this situationist practice by adding a new meaning to it. To the pure, purely visual perception of space, which contains the dimension of meaning, Helbig adds a double-layered auditory level, disorienting the listener and introducing them to the artistic game. It cannot be called a purely participatory art, since Helbig man maintains a dominant position as an artist, guiding the participants along a set road map. He establishes artistic communication with the recipients who then communicates with space they move through. The recipient is in this case also a performer alone in the realization of the final product of auditory perceptual and sensory intricacy which has an authentic and inimitable sen sensual effect of the on the participants this work is based on two of Helbig concepts, self-performativity, self a rather self-explanatory term, and intro-activity, which denotes the internalization of the artistic product. Helbig starts from the subjective experience, which is always fundamentally internal, and which can remain and become completely internal. That is an authentic form of experience, which does not manifest itself toward the, toward the outside world. 
The same applies to the so-called earpieces. Earpieces are based exclusively on listening to given sound sources while covering the ears in a way determined by the artist's concept. Such is the work of uh, No Music, subtitled The Music for the Ears. The participants uh, receive, receive different uh, auditory direction depending on the way the ears are covered. That is, his auditory perception is directed in the different ways and with different intensity. It is a kind of manipulation of spatial perception, which in turn connects to Helbig's dealing with the relationship between sound and space. That is, propagation of sound and its reception. Therefore, this con concept deals with the idea of, of establishing relations with the environment, which represents the source of sound, its manifestation in the consciousness of the recipients, that is, the intensity and the way of receiving the auditory impulse is determined by limitations of the sound flow. The work is based on the concept of listening as a performative act. As the author notes, I quote, the event triggers musical experience without being actually music, end of quote. It is an attempt to creatively, crit, crit, uh, creatively work with silence, so to speak. Therefore, silence in itself, or even better, the sounds of the environment, becomes a kind of uh, building material for manipulation. Again, conditionally speaking. The listener, in this sense, following the artist's concept, creates an autonomous auditory experience, which is always unique, taking into account different auditory content, which changes from situation to situation. Helbig thus withdraws from the role of content creator and assumes the role of a creator of a performative act. I must note that there are similar ideas presented by Peter Ab Ablinger, David Dunn, or Robin Hoffman, but that will be another topic for my next paper. The pinnacle of this way of artistic uh, thinking, self-performance, as the author calls this body of work, is certainly the Imagine There Was No Roof with the subtitle Interactive Sound Meditation. The work includes a series of rugs and carpets that all have instructions for imagined listening. For example, imagine the sound of a party at the neighbor's or in the bathroom of a club. The audience is therefore invited to recall a certain sound and mentally manipulate it. As Helbig notes, Imagining as much as remembering and anticipating are all listening spaces adjustment to acoustics. For this, the experience of sound is regarded as that of a movement a back and forth between the inner and outer spaces of our body from the opposite wall to our spinal shaped ear directly into the brain and into the last corners of thoughts and back. When we hear sound, while sound swirls around us, we think it too. Somewhat analytically, yet also quite creative, creatively, we think our hearing into existence. This physical and cognitive intrinsic elements of the acoustics experience is the departure point and the source of the aesthetic result in the work, end of quote. So artist is working with the concept which includes non-existing sound, sounds that exist solely in memory. In this sense, the work moves into pure introspection without really auditory stimuli. Based on these three categories of work that we find in the oeuvre of this artist, we can reach three circles of problems while considering them. The first is related to the phenomenological consideration of the concept. In this sense, sound walks could be examined through a prism of phenomenological research concerning the relationship between space, that is auditory fields and focal sounds. Adopting Husserl terminolo terminology Philosopher Don Eide notes that uh, listening within the environment itself implies intentionality and the establishment of relations between ubiquitous and focal sounds. As this author claims, within intentionality there is the ray of attention, the intuition of essences. Halbig plays with precisely this property of the auditory experience offering to the perception two auditory plans, that is shifting perception away from the field that is present to the field that is explicit. And ID further notes, the field is what is pre present, but present is implicit as fringe that situates and surrounds what is explicit or focal. Also, he plays with the, the relationship between the auditory and visual field of perception which face each other. The auditory perception of the sound of the environment implies the activation of the visual imagination as well. However, in Helbig's work, there is a conflict between the actions of the, these senses due, due to the presence of different auditory planes. 
As ID notes, uh, both uh, surroundability and uh, direction, di directionality must be noted as co-present. This uh, double dimensionality of auditory field characteristic is at once the source of much ambiguity and of specific richness that subtle subtly pervades the auditory dimension of existence. Both these dimensional as aspects of auditory presence, presence uh, are constant and co-present, but the intentional focus and the situation varies the ratio of what may stand out. There is also a nomadic difference in relation to what kind of sound the may most clearly presents itself as primarily surrounding the, and primarily directional without losing its counterpart. Uh, end of quote. In Helbig's work, these elements of perception are mixed. As for the second group of work, works called ear pieces, they explore yet another phenomenological question concerning the directionality of listening and perception of the environment, that is spe speciality of the auditory field, namely as the aforementioned phenomenolog phenomenologist uh, notes, ID. Uh, I quote, it is clear that within the auditory field, we may speak of the direction of a given sound. It comes from behind me, for example, and of particular sounds uh, we may perceive as being near or far from us. But as a field, we must say that it surrounds us. I'm, uh, I'm uh, immersed in the auditory field that displays no definite boundaries, such as those of vision. The sound field, unlike the visual field, which remains in front of me, displays an indefinite space in in all directions from me, end of quote. Covering of the ears in uh, Helbig's work also changes the perceptual relationship to the sound field, that is, it becomes spatially distorted. Finally, the third group of works labeled as interactive sound meditations are based on the imaginative aspect of the auditory experience. Uh, as um, ID says, in the most general terms, auditory imagination as a whole displays the same gener uh, generic possibilities as the full imaginative mode of experience. Within the active imag uh, imaginative mode of experience lies the full range from sedimented memories to wildest fantasies. In fantasy, I can uh, presentify and represent the sound of the world, end of quote. Thus, uh, these works are counting on the developed imaginative component of the sound potential of the individual who participates uh, in the work. Uh, the second problematic circle uh, concerning this work, uh, works in, is connected with their aesthetic direction, whereby they rest on the basic Cajun idea of sound already mentioned before. That is flu uh, Flux's attitude toward art, as formulated by uh, Matunas, who wrote in uh, 1963 that art needs to promote a revolutionary flood of and tide in art, promote living art, anti-art, etc. Therefore, this last group of works is moving toward anti-sound, that is an exclusion of the basic artistic means from the artistic experience through intellectual transgression. And finally, the third problematic circle is connected with the ontology of the musical piece, that is the question of the uh, music um, uh, sound. In all three cases, it is the listener who becomes the performer and the sound impression exists as autonomous and unique, while in the last case, it remains only on the imaginary plane and the plane of artists' intellectual experiment. As the author notes uh, when talking about Soundbox, but also about the general direction of his work, it is ultimately more about us being our own material, end of quote. In all three cases, however, the author remains inviolable, so it is not a question of open participatory type creations, but of conceptual creations that function in a certain public context. It is therefore interesting that the author does not renounce his position as a composer. He does not call himself, for example, a conceptual artist, considering that he continued to work with sound only in different contexts, whereby the material is being found around and within the individual that is uh, in audience itself. Helbig describes this dominant position as an artist of extremely authentic works with the following words, which with which I will end today's presentation. Uh, the world is chaotic, but what I offer is highly structured. In that sense, I am still very much composing." End of quote. Thank you. Thank you, Radosh, for a quite compact presentation. We will have some time for coffee quite soon, but still there is some minutes for questions and comments from, from the audience, please. Well, thank you, Radosh. Um, I am going back to one of the 
initial statements by Helbig that you quoted about uh, the concept. Uh, I can't remember it exactly, but um, this conceptual part, I mean, the very concept of the concept. Uh, on the one hand, you were, uh, uh, you, you have uh, included this phenomenological approach. Now, phenomenology is about uh, um, this intentional mind, the content of the mind and how it reaches uh, the object. Uh, where does the concept fit into that? Is it uh, something which exists a priori or something which arises somehow by subsequent reflection on, on this phenomenological experience? I don't know where I make myself clear. I... Uh, um, I, I, as I understood your question, um, uh, can you repeat, <laughs> sorry. I, I, I lost uh, it. I the concept. Is it before. something which uh, is it something which pre-exists? Uh, in which case, uh, I'm not quite comfortable with this phenomenological approach. No, no. no. Uh, uh, the idea is uh, uh, that the concept is only. Um, um, raw idea uh, and uh, everything else is uh, on the part of the listener so uh, concept is uh, just direction and um, artist is directing the uh, perception in some way but not fully so everything else is uh, on a context uh, in which the, uh, the, the piece uh, is working so Actually, maybe. the 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 creator himself, I mean, Helbig himself, may not have chosen the best possible expression for uh, for what he wanted to say in in light of what you have just explained. I mean, perhaps yeah. it's not of course, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, yeah. but uh, now I understand what you mean. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I have one question. Um, uh, because you said that sandwalks are generally, it is the, the idea, the concept that is based on Cage's idea. And um, for me, it's not clear because I would say that sandwalks, uh, generally this concept derives from acoustic ecology. <laughs> and it is my first association. So uh, do you think that uh, Helbig, have you have you ever thought about it? The, did he say something about his inspiration of acoustic ecology approach? Uh, that uh, is my question. Yes, yes, yes. I, I understand you. Yes, of course, the acoustic ecology is something that, um, um, for example, he mentions David Dunn, and David Dunn is, as I know, a composer who is dealing with that. But um, uh, no, he he uh, does not explicitly relate himself with acoustic phenomena. Uh, um, uh, yes, but um, of uh, his rela his relations is connected with, uh, uh, and he explicitly says that with John Cage and Fluxus movement, uh, anti art, etc. And why I mentioned the John Cage, it is uh, just purely because of the idea of the uh, context um, uh, of, of the something that we might call contextual art rather than conceptual. And maybe uh, I'm now answering a question with, uh, which uh, Professor Zatklik also um, asked. Uh, it is not maybe conceptual art in this that sense, uh, rather con contextual art. And four minute, 33 seconds second is really uh, that kind of uh, uh, art. So that's why I mentioned John Cage. Uh, of course, it is not directly connected with him, but um, uh, Helbig uh, wants to uh, in his um, uh, artistic um, roots uh, to be connected with Fluxus movement and uh, with John Cage. That's why I, I mentioned uh, Cage. So, if there are no more questions or comments, shall we consider which session already finished?
Thank you very much, Rados, for your last you. presentation. And let's. Thank you. Let's have a rest and prepare for the next session. Explain the sound. Okay, share. And you will present your presentation. Just, just now. Why doesn't why doesn't the screen change now? I use the. Okay. I will not be presenting. I will join you. You don't have that. <laughs> Thank you very much. There is a Oh, it's I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, let's start with the next session. Our next speaker will be Professor Milos Zatkalik from the University of Arts in Belgrade. And he's very well known to this conference series that I even made the mistake uh, to think that he's belonging to your staff. Uh, so uh, I heard several presentations of you. You are. You, you are even. So I didn't make this mistake. No, I. I... You have a very uh, wide uh, range of research interests. That's quite impressive. And uh, you were presenting and teaching all over the world, uh, including Germany, uh, my home country. And today we will hear your presentation on musical communication between Niklas Luhmann and Gilles Dillers. We are very keen on listening to you. Well, hello everyone. I still can't hear you. I, I need to play this. You need to play this.
commenting on his Grand Meyer award-winning composition on the Guarding of the Heart for chamber, orchestra, and piano, the Serbian-Swedish composer Djuro Rivkovic demands that at the end of the piece, the excerpt that we had just heard, the sound must melt the walls in the hall. While this statement with significant ontological, psychological, and even theological implications communicates something about the composition, one might ask what and how does the composition itself, and especially this wall melting gesture, communicate? This is what the present paper sets to explore, relying to a considerable extent on the ideas of the social system theorists Niklas Luhmann and philosophers Theodor Adorno and Gilles Deleuze. A significant portion of the paper will be devoted not to this specific composition, but to broader issues of communication in the context of artistic creation and reception. For now, the Zhivkovich quotation serves as a teaser, but those patient enough to listen through this talk might in the end be rewarded with answers to the opening question. Reluctantly, I pass over these core excerpts, we don't have time for them, and proceed to the theoretical part. That the work of art is produced for the purpose of communication is hardly an overstatement. It accomplishes this goal or fails to do so, but by facing the usual and perhaps even increased risks involved in all communication. Where from these perhaps increased risks? First, as Luhmann reminds us, art communicates by using perceptions contrary to their primary purpose. Art seeks a different kind of relationship between perception and communication, one that is irritating and defies normality. Next, artistic communication is less predictable. As part of this observation, art not only conveys certain information, which is guaranteed by this lack of predictability, but it also must communicate in such a way as to suggest that everything could be done differently. I will clarify this by invoking George Spencer Brown's laws of form, whereby form draws a distinction between the marked space of the work and the unmarked space of everything else. Possibly outside the realm of arts, this distinction renders the unmarked invisible. The work of art on the contrary, always promises something else without defining it. It dissolves the homogeneity of the unmarked space into a space replete with suggestions. In other words, generally speaking, this space beyond the boundaries defined by the form is invisible and homogeneous in its invisibility. But the work of art opens communication paths precisely with the unmarked space created by the very same work of art. It renders accessible what is invisible without it. This brings to mind Deleuze's view about rendering invisible forces visible in painting and inaudible forces audible in music. Artistic communication must go beyond any lived or even livable experience. In music, it may be relatively clear as music's relation to that sort of experience is tenuous and oblique, but it is no less true in other modes of artistic expression, literature or painting, for instance, where we sometimes mistakenly expect representation of the world. Starting from such premises, I will first indicate several aspects of communication in arts. The commonsensical view of communication as a one-way affair between the creator and the preceding subject is not altogether wrong, but it is oversimplified to the point where its usefulness becomes doubtful. Luhmann's system theory dresses communication as a system of its own, independent but running simultaneously with the system of consciousness. He challenges some of the most fundamental propositions about communication. First, the principle of the autonomous unified subjects. Second, communication as an interaction between separate consciousness. Um, let me, third, communication as a transmission of mental contents between separate consciousness. 
And finally, he insists that understanding does not require an accurate reconstruction of the creator's true intentions. Concerning this last one, Adorno's comparison with the message in a bottle is certainly worth remembering. Art is also communication across generations or between different cultures. Furthermore, analysis while being inherent in any meaningful reception of art has its own specific domain and the specific purpose of making art aware of itself qua art. In other words, via analysis, a work of art communicates not only with the recipient who is also an analyst, but also with itself in its emancipatory movements toward constituting itself as an autonomous system and securing its place astraddle the social and psychic spheres. Here we can think of Adorno's idea that the only art aware of itself is an analyzed art. As a corollary, corollary occupying the place at the boundary between social and psychic systems, art may be seen as communication between the two. Communication is also established within the listener, him or herself, particularly in the way art facilitates the discharge of unconscious primordial effects or conjures the archaic unconscious mental states. This amounts to communication between various layers of human psyche. Arguably, music being closest to the unconscious goes the longest way in achieving this. In a certain sense, artistic products communicate among themselves. It could be said that, for example, the introduction to Beethoven's first symphony communicates back with Haydn's symphonies and forward with Tchaikovsky's sixth. I'm afraid I cannot elaborate this within the given time frame. And communication takes place even within a work of art. The whole enables its elements to function together, makes possible a system of communication among these elements that in themselves do not communicate. Perhaps it is the principal problem in the arts to establish such a system. The foregoing discussion suggests that works of art can be properly understood if granted a degree of autonomy, even from their creators resulting in communication between the creator and his or her own work. Luhmann says, most of the time artists are in no position to provide a satisfactory account of their intentions. Even the artist can see what he wanted only upon realizing what he has done. This is seconded by Deleuzean scholar Simon Sullivan. The word of art speaks back to the artist or appears to come from somewhere else. This somewhere else opens complex ontological questions, which I approach via certain concepts or Deleuze or deleuze Guattari, precisely Deleuzean ontological dimensions of the virtual or chaotic, the intensive, and the extensive or actual. To begin with, Art, science, and philosophy confront chaos. Art takes a bit of chaos and puts it into frame in order to form a composed chaos that becomes sensory. Chaos is, however, not a nothingness, but a virtual containing all possible particles and drawing out all possible forms. Not absolute disorder, but rather a plethora of orders. An infinite number of particles moving at infinite speed vanishing as soon as created. I will venture a conjecture that this is precisely what stifles communication within that dimension. It is then the, scientist, the task of the scientist, the philosopher, and the artist to extract vibratory rhythms from chaos. The field of intensities arises with its intensive properties like velocity or heat. This is where the philosopher's concepts, the scientist's states of affairs, and the artist's effects and percepts take shape. And let us also be reminded that for Deleuze, effects and percepts are pre-personal, independent of the state of those who experience them. Out of this non-metric, virtual, intensive continuum, 
the individual work of art is actualized through the condensation of discontinuous metric extensive structures. This probably occurs in every composition. It may well be that a traditional classical composition absorbs the first two dimensions. The final product is one of relatively stable entities of measurable extensive time space of the score, striated space as the Les and Guattari call it in a thousand plateaus. Contrarywise, in the guarding of the heart, the intensive flux does not solidify completely, does not produce musical objects that are too rigid, molar, if you use terminology, terminology from plateaus. This may be the first part of the answer to the question. What does this composition communicate? What Zhilkovich's composition communicates, for reasons that can be properly understood only if we listen to the entire piece, are not solid, fully formed, discrete entities, such as themes, phrases, tonal centers, and the like. Instead of the actualized, it presents the very process of actualization. It could be an account of how these ontological dimensions communicate among themselves. This survey of communicative, communicative channels in music closes with an observation that music is music not only because it is a string of sounds, but there must be a human agent who will imbue that string of sounds with a musical meaning. As a necessary but not a sufficient condition, there is an agreement between a significant number of human subjects and that something is music, meaning that there must be a way of human subjects, the creator included, communicated, communicating musical experience. They are all caught in an intricate communicative web with innumerable feedback loops. Ultimately, it is not about a sender conveying a message to the receiver, but they all become enmeshed in this complexity. The Lesian rhizome comes to mind here. The net has neither the beginning nor the end, nor fixed communication channels, and any point can be connected to any other. That effectively renders communication pre-personal and self-referential. It presupposes living beings capable of consciousness, but is irreducible to any one of these beings, not even to all of them taken together. And indeed, that is what Luhmann has in mind when he talks about communication as an autopoetic and autotelic system. Autopoiesis, the concept he adopts from Schiller, bi biologists and philosophers Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela, implies inaccessibility of subjectivity and inability of communication to directly produce or receive perceptions. We cannot really communicate subjectivity. The relationships between the, these different systems, consciousness and communication, are defined as structural coupling. This is how Maturana and Varela describe the relationship between an organism and its environment, generalizing it also as interaction between an entity in a general sense and its medium, triggering in each other structural changes. The environment can perturb the system, but the system will still operate on itself. The perturbation affects the system, but cannot specify the exact changes that will be produced. We can think of it as two black boxes that make their own behavior contingent upon the behavior of the other. Art cannot overcome the separation between psychic and social systems. Both types of system remain operatively inaccessible to each other. Disparate systems operate simultaneously, are synchronized and constrain one another's freedom. Like any other autopoetic system, communication is autotelic, primarily concerned with its own self-reproduction. Nowhere is it clearer than in art. Communication recursively recalls and anticipates further communications. And solely within the network of self-created communications can it produce communications as the operative elements of its own system. From this, as we have already indicated, 
Luhmann infers that understanding neither requires an accurate reconstruction of the sender's true intentions, nor excludes the possibility of misunderstanding. The mere fact that the observational sequences that accompany the work's production necessarily differ from these that occur in the perception of the finished work ensures that there can never be there can never be a genuine agreement between the two. Again, recall Adorno's message in the bottle. Now that we have come up with psychic systems and social systems with communication existing as a system in its own right, as a boundary between the two, all systems operationally closed, yet related through structural coupling. We cannot but sense certain Leibnizian overtones. Leibniz means Gottfried Leibniz, the philosopher, but also Leibniz as Deleuze's conceptual persona in his book, The Fold, Leibniz and the Baroque. Autopoiesis imparts qualities of the monad to a work. Leibniz's monads are closed, mutually inaccessible, yet functioning together in pre-established harmony. That a musical composition can be associated with a monad has already been suggested by Adorno. A monad only unfolds what is folded in it, in its dark background, somber font, as the rest call it. Furthermore, the entire world is folded into a monad, but each monad expresses some facet of the world with special clarity, having its specific, specific enlightened region. This Zhivkovic indeed does, folding into his work a plethora of both musical and extra musical references, Eastern Orthodox mysticism, Greek philosophers, mathematicians, Pythagoras and Archytas, Serbian folklore, cutting edge contemporary compositional techniques and more. They are not so much separate entities, but one folded innumerable times. It is here that Deleuze's fold enters into the picture, thinking difference without entailing separation. And it is here that we hope to provide the next part to the answer to the initial question. This composition communicates not so much about all these sources of inspiration, but about the very possibility of their folding together and the process of folding together. The material and spiritual worlds folded together, not the dualism of Descartes, not a transcendence, rather folds on the plane of immanence. This brings us to the final step we need to take. Suppose that the development within the monad reach a singular point where the function breaks down. The monad ceases to behave according to the expected protocol, even to open passive lightness. As a matter of fact, at the end of Deleuze's book, monads do open after all. The stage, stage for this may have been set with the assertion that the clear and distinguished zone of the monad has a tendency to vary for each monad. The privileged zone offers spatial vectors and temporal tensors of augmentation or diminution. What if there is a critical threshold of augmentation? Deleuze recognizes that closer to our time, something has changed in the situation of monads. Leibniz's monads submit to two conditions, one of closure and the other of selection. On the one hand, they include an entire world that does not exist outside of them. On the other, this world takes for granted a first selection of convergence, since it is distinguished from other possible di but divergent worlds. Of course, Leibniz's idea is that God has created the best of all possible worlds, or has chosen the best of all possible worlds, in which pre-established harmony exists between compossible monads. But the rest proceeds. This selection tends to be disappearing. When the monad is in tune with divergent series that belong to incompossible monads, then the monad as straddle of several worlds is kept half open as if by a pair of pliers. 
Significantly, it is precisely in this context that Deleuze specifically invokes modern music, Stockhausen, Blaise. This is how I interpret the end of Zhivkovich's composition. The intensity of this internal development reaches some critical threshold sufficient to explode the monad from within. Heat and intensive property is applied. The said critical threshold or singularity or the point of dissolution of the system is reached and the walls melt. Barrier against the world, barriers between the audience and the world, indeed, the barriers within the listener's mind are obliterated. The Lesian lines of flight allow us to communicate with the cosmos. Communication then attains a paradoxical state. It reaches out toward the infinite, but the molten walls are also the ones between the listener's inner and outer worlds. Communication is then directed inward toward our inner unconscious world. But if this appears, to be the ultimate point of any communicative situation, it also collapses the distinction between the internal and external, between the subject and the object, and no structural cutting is possible. At such rare moments that can plausibly be equated with a phenomenon of aesthetic peak experience, the self Reproducing communicative operations leads towards self annihilation. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Uh, being so full of information, and thank you for this interesting approach. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Milos, as always, <laughs> for your provocative presentation. Uh, I have a question about the um, Nikos uh, model of uh, communication. Uh, Art, woman, yeah, 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 woman, yeah. Uh, how do you grapple with the absence of the performance in his model, like in music, if music, uh, art includes music, right? Since there is no uh, performance at all as an uh, embodiment of music, right, as art, how do you grapple with the problem? Uh, actually, this is a problem. Now, how does he deal with that? It's a more complicated thing because he has written about 70 something books and about 400 articles. And whether he has really addressed that, I don't know. But um, uh, basically, that's something which uh, I may even say, in a way, plagues a great deal of European musical tradition music as music and reflections on music and uh, uh, the way we conceive of music. Uh, we were just talking something the outside during the coffee break. And, you know, European uh, music basically thinks in terms some something which reaches out. I think that uh, more ancient and probably uh, an approach which is more typical in Africa, music is body. And that is something that in Europe, people are we're beginning to rediscover only sometime in the 20th century and not, not very early in the 20th century. The idea of embodied condition, cognition, all this stuff comes from the end of the 20th century. So yeah, that's really something which is missing from my account. Right, because if music, uh, like listeners do not hear the score, they hear sounds, right? So that's kind of my problem with his uh, but ultimately, uh, system. Uh, this, uh, we can see actually that uh, in the statement that Jorah Vukovic himself, uh, the sound must melt the world. Obviously, it can neither be taken quite literally, it doesn't melt the walls. 
not purely metaphorically, because uh, uh, simply there is something which happens in our minds. Okay, thank it you. It's quite yes. realistic. It, it has some material, physical base. Mm -hmm. Neurosciences tell us that. Tell us that. You mentioned one other uh, important aspects, copy breaks are the places for the really important talks. So you might continue with that. And we have time for one more question, I think, if there is one, please. Thank you very much for your presentation. And probably it's some widely then context of your presentation, but um, uh, as for you, for me, we have uh, many problems with communication of contemporary art music. Uh, this is our audience because many of uh, our listeners haven't such experience of um, understanding the communication with such new, new music. And probably, um, uh, do you think about? Uh, uh, ways of decision such problem of uh, this communication thank you uh, no i will choose to answer this not so much as a scholar but as someone who has also done some composing in my life uh, again uh, that you seal the message in a bottle and you throw it in the ocean and some will pick it up, some will understand it or misunderstand it or throw it away. Uh, I don't think I can really afford to think in this sense how it will communicate. It is enough that we are all when we create constrained by so many external factors, we are part of certain society, we are part of certain culture. This is something which in part defines our, our uh, creative decisions. Uh, and then we are also constrained by, you know, but no longer than 50 minutes, if, if it is, you know, a conditioned piece or something like that, and you have a specific ensemble for which you write, and you have so many limitations, uh, too many to think, additional no and how on earth are they going to listen no you, you you just can't afford that even if you wanted to even if you want no i want to score a big hit you know but far too many constraints all around you that you can really afford to add yet another one thank you also from our side uh, thank you for your presentation and also for the discussion And we will go ahead with our next speaker. Christopas Gikas from the Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theatre. It's my pleasure. He graduated from the Cialoni School of Arts in 2012 and is a flute specialist in the best sense of the word and uh, in many facets. Um, he also has uh, studied at the Royal Conservatory in The Hague. Um, and today we hear his presentation simply entitled Dimensions of Interaction. The stage is yours. Hello, everyone. I'll need a few minutes to prepare, but I'll be fast. Is, uh, can we receive some help? I need to connect to the screen. How to share the screen? Um, what to get rid of the
Just one last thing. Okay. and make it full screen. So hello everyone, I'm Christopher Zgikas. Um, I'm studying uh, electroacoustic music and interaction um, at the contemporary music department at the Academy of mm -hmm. uh, of music and theater. And today I want to uh, present a topic, Dimensions of, of Interaction, which is part of my um, thesis that I'm writing, which is about extended flute as a concept and electroacoustic um, music uh, creating methods as interaction. So today, dimensions of interaction. The main points are interactive process in arts needs to be detached from IT context. So that's the thing what I noticed when I started um, going deeper into this topic that a lot of authors um, are writing about interaction only as um, informational technology um, influence or part of it in music field. But instead of that, we have much more particles in it and it, it's not necessarily connected to informational technology. And um, now we could say like it was um, sometime before because the term interaction is very old let's say a few decades old and it uh, the meaning of it changed during time and i think we need to adopt new meaning to it another point is interaction of a game or social interaction is much more familiar to musical performance than it which is um, some of the composers are implying game structure into uh, musical creative process and it's definitely much closer to music uh, than informational technology we could say much closer to art uh, is game and social interactions another point is broaden the perspective of interaction considering more members involved so another thing what i noticed and what um, a lot of authors writing about this topic lacks of is that they are focusing only on artist and listener interaction and there are also a lot more members involved and another point is that interaction 
itself becomes an aesthetic object if it's evaluated and um, in, in, in good uh, methods and understood well. So uh, what's that interaction? The meaning of interaction, inter and actio, it means between and action or execution. Uh, the term itself does not suggest the continuity of the process in time and does not name the members what they should be or how they interact. Interaction describes the interaction between two or more objects. The term is used in many disciplines chemistry, biology, physics, sports, or everyday social situations. Interaction is a kind of action that occurs uh, as two or more objects have an effect upon one another. That's the most popular um, description of interaction, and it uh, fits to many of the disciplines, although they are quite different. And the main process what is going on on interaction also that fits to many um, disciplines is listen process and answer it's it's one cycle interaction and when later we go deeper into it and we see that this in this cycle can be repeated transformed and variated as uh, as it as it goes in time so um, one more thing that a work of art can only be considered interactive if two members of the chain can influence the course of the work with input that works within the framework of the work and correlates with its structure. So um, difficulties talking about interactive art and interactive process is that it's really hard to find the right criteria and methods to measure it uh, if we want to put it in degrees of intensity it's quite difficult to to make it in a number so i suggest we approach more um factors and situations how it's developed in different contexts of musical art and by by those description we can then uh, later on identi I, I identify different approaches and better understand how how intensive the interaction is or um, the capacity of interaction and components in it so uh, one of the main and important things is dual ontological structure. And that means that we have dual structure, which one part of it is stable and fundamental. Another is variable, uh, depending on one of the interaction members. Um, another criteria would be type and components of a cycle. What, uh, what, what is happening on that cycle when two or more members interact in between. Then reactivity, its type and its speed between the interactors and number, relatedness and quality of cycles. What I already mentioned, um, it's one of the we could say obvious uh, things uh, when when we know what's happening in interactive process, we can identify if it's one cycle or if it's a lot of cycles uh, going uh, one after another and which are connected. So let's go to the examples. And example number one is Anthony Braxton, composer, multi-instrumentalist, uh, creative musician, as he mentions himself. And one of the examples of interaction in acoustic music is collect collective composed improvisation. 
and what we also uh, lack in description of interaction or in examples of interaction in music that it's almost everywhere um, based on electroacoustic or on electronics and we barely hear that um, interaction is happening like active interaction ha is happening in acoustic music and this um, example shows that it's very possible and it's a lot of um, components in it. Uh, so composer Anthony Braxton has continuously researched music connotation systems throughout his long creative career as well as developing the possibilities of interaction through the principle of composed improvisation, acoustic ensembles, and later the context of live electronics and sound programming. His music, as he calls it, creative music, gives improvising instrumentalists the freedom to interpret musical material within certain structural, structural frameworks according to established but variable rules. And Braxton promotes the mediation of performance in the realization of musical ideas, which is already a um, component of interaction. And I chose exactly composition three to two because it has several essential interactive elements. So the first one is the notation, as you see, has one melodic line for the whole ensemble in which, in which the rhythm is spelled out precisely and the tones are accurate in most places, but also have possibilities of alteration that can be developed by the performer. So a uh, performer has the freedom to interpret this, let's say, simple uh, line. And another thing, uh, another component of interaction is that the notes written in the box are replaced by episodes that are free in terms of material. So we see those graphical notation elements that could be interpreted in either graphical notation way of playing or in traditional way of playing. Uh, if we follow under, under graphical notation, um, there is a traditional notation that is simultaneously performed and each of the performers can choose uh, whether they play gra graphical notation uh, phrases or uh, what's underneath. And uh, one of the most interactive component in this piece is portals. So we can see a circle, a square, and tri triangle as a signs for a portal to start or to finish. And circle represents an improvisation. A triangle refers to additional material of the trio. And trio part is another uh, part that is uh, proposed in the end of this piece. And a square allows the insertion of any other composition from the composer's work. These actions can be selected individually, but the general progress of the piece is constantly followed so that when leaving the portal, the ensemble returns to the general material of the piece. So this piece lets performers to choose their own way from uh, point A to point Z. And there's a lot of choices, but on the other hand, all the performance, uh, all the performers are uh, in synchronization with each other all the time while performing. Um, when each member of the ensemble chooses an individu individual development of the musical material unfolding within the same framework, the effect of the work as a multi of organism with independent and mutually communicating members appears. These aspects provide a variety of opportunities for a piece to develop uniquely from a fixed beginning. Second example is performance art. Uh, and one, uh, one performer, performance art artist, Simonis Nekrosius, is a, a Lithuanian uh, sound artist that makes his own instruments. And 
his performances are a great example of interactive art and composed improvisation. Even if the composed part is fixed, not on the paper, but in his head. So participating in the performances of this artist, the fact of both audio and visual dramaturgy becomes obvious. Um, I, I have visited uh, quite a lot uh, performances of this artist and every time I saw the same form, but very, very different result coming out of it. And obvious uh, components are destructiveness, the process, processuality of which depends on many variables. And although the form of the performance remains the same, the sound design and music architecture are significantly different each time. Each time the artist prepares a certain set of instruments and tools that he uses, this is his starting point. And later the artist integrates into the instrument, but since the artist is a part of the instrument to swallow and it is a heart for the instrument to swallow and digest, the destruction of the instrument begins into separate falling, breaking, stumbling, hooking, switching the parts on and off uh, of the instrument. Separate sliver sounding with a unique timbre. Each event is not only visible, but the process of destruction is also amplified. So uh, artist itself, he defines interaction in his work as follows. From the perspective of the constructor of sound objects, interactivity is most closely related to the process of creating objects, exploring situations, establishing a connection between the creator and matter. The choice of a certain material or technology responds to the function of the work and its applicability. Audio and visual interactivity is an inseparable nuance of every performance because often the performances and certain choices are unexpected, not only for the viewer, but also for the performer himself. So um, performer, performers, uh, this performance has no score, um, only the main route from uh, point, starting point to ending point um but it gives different results in sound and and even in visual aspects so uh that's very good example of dual uh, ontological structure and third example is by another composer and saxophonist john zor um as i mentioned earlier uh Game structure is game interaction is much closer to um, music art than IT interaction, uh, also as social interaction. Uh, and this example is um, built, this comp composition is built on a tabletop game, which was called World War II. And it has two pages of instructions, uh, which are not published anywhere. It's uh, it's it's it it's held in memory of participants and uh, artists, and they give um, information from uh, just verbally. And this piece is built on game structure requires effective reaction because there is always a narrator which as a conductor which shows all the signs and and um, gives the rules although the rules can always change by the uh, will of performer and it it is strongly communicated because you always have to be on time and uh, communicate with your members of ensemble and it gives the player certain constraints but resists limits so within the rules there are plenty of freedom to uh, to act to to propose uh, for an artist their own ideas so this piece is um obviously for improvising a musician um ensemble uh, which which could be in any size any instrumentation 
um, and and it gives it gives a lot of freedom as to when to finish the piece, uh, when to quit the game. So, um, as I see, we don't have much time, so I'm going to the end. Um, summary uh, would be that interactive art should be independent from IT context. Um, and interactive work has its own limitations and capacities or possibilities. But at the same time, it is an open medium with infinite perspectives on the interactive process. Variables that are difficult to calculate because there is no finite number of them. The dual ontology of the work is a necessary and most important condition for interactive art, which is operated by at least two members of the chain, knowing the fundamental version of the work and the variable version of the work can approximate the scope of the work's diversity or variables and how much the work can deviate from its intended path in different instant instances throughout interaction. Game interaction and social interaction is more familiar to music than IT. And I suggest expanding the primitive approach based on the basis of active performer spectator interaction uh, involving composer uh, instrument composition as an as a object to interact and others. And nurture and improve the interaction processes so that it becomes an aesthetic object. In such circumstances, when, when many members, variables, and digital, digital technologies are involved in the creative or of performance process, it is not easy to de determine a specific gradation of the spectrum of interaction. But knowing the discussed criteria and features makes it easier to identify the abundance of interactive processes and more objectively assess the value of an interactive work of art. It's not that interactive art is more valuable or better than non-interactive, but it makes an artwork more organic and gives it a lot more of the communicative possibilities. And for the last two minutes, I have the last example uh, with which we can actually get back to the main um, original uh, description of a term, getting back to informational technology. And I have prepared a, actually I, I have turned on a uh, patch algorithm and it was recording all the time while I, I was talking here. And we could listen what's what's happening here. I just introduce you a little. All these processes happen very fast and simultaneously so that when you use live in real time interaction with the musician, oh, Max, this program gives the flavor of an immediate improvisation com between the performer and the machine because the performer also reacts to the machine's production, thus impacting on the model's evolution. It may install a double feedback that we call stylistic reinjection. So it was recording for 20 minutes and let's, let's just see what computer alone uh, can do from the material that was feeded into it. All these process install a composition mediation of performance. All these process install a composition mediation so performance. Let's install a double is a necessary or most the so or let's cite what are important. And another point is broadening instrumentalism gives it a lot of first traditional overlays with its structure. Well, of course, if we use instruments for this program, it gives much more uh, various and diverse results than only talking. But you can get the idea about the uh, feeding information, uh, acoustic information into the program and giving it freedom 
to form new phrases of it and new musical material. Although I didn't adjust any settings, which are plenty of them here, I just uh, wanted to see the basic uh, process, how it works. Um, and if we would consider the criteria of interaction by the number of interaction cycles or circles, which is listen, process, and answer, we could count, it's starting to, to feedback. Uh, we could count on one cycle past, but if we'd continue to play together with this algorithm, we'd pro proceed to the next cycles and stages while the program would continue recording and commun communicating, we could reach infinite number of cycles and each of them would be related to each other. So that's what I was talking about, the cycles and importance of that, that if we if we leave it uh, like this, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't really work uh, further. But if we continue playing with it and it continue uh, communicates with us, it gives us, um, well, very, very different uh, results, which are connected uh, together, all this uh, narrative. So that's what I wanted to present, and thank you. Thank you for your interesting and stimulating presentation. Thank you for giving us some insights into your research project. And thank you for this very special surprising end. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Well, yeah, <laughs> really, I, I, I enjoy that. It was a very good game you played on us uh, with with this um, final. <clears throat> but I wonder, um, the program itself, because I'm, I'm not really familiar with it, uh, it works according to a certain algorithm, but um, can it... Uh, you know, can can it uh, work on a higher level like artificial intelligence to learn from to to learn from from its own previous work yes. independently of what you have initially said? Exactly. You mean uh, machine learning? Uh, yeah. Course. Yes, definitely. It works just exactly like that, mm -hmm. and it works at the highest level. It works already uh, more than 15 years this program mm -hmm. is alive and just uh, more developed and a lot of improvisers top-notch improvisers are using it and composers as well as a as a very useful process in music creation it's very smart yeah <laughs> Kevin. any other questions maybe one more question to be nearly in time Actually, I had another one. Uh, so, uh, if if nobody else is willing to to ask, I'll i going to. Uh, you mentioned this dual ontology. Uh, the first time you, uh, you mentioned and you explained it, there was something which uh, was troubling me. Can you repeat your your first introduction of this idea? Yes. So, dual ontology is based on the idea that. It works in two parallels. So first one is fundamental structure that is, let's say, uh, all of the examples had this from A to Z, from start to the end. And second parallel depends on artists, on composer, on anyone who involves in uh, interactive process and it changes uh, by their decisions. So it's kind of two parallels that one is going straight and another is modulating, modulating around, but still comes to the same place with just very a lot of variables. Yeah, okay, that clarifies it. Uh, you didn't exactly say that, so there was something unclear to me. Now, now it's perfectly okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again. So, and now we will proceed with another presentation. Uh, I received the information 
that there might be the chance that Ina Ivanova from the National Academy of Music um, of Ukraine uh, might be able, thank you, might be able to connect. Yes. Is she there? Great. Congratulations, dear participants of the conference. I'm here. That's wonderful. We hear you. Yes. <laughs> she has electricity, right? That's wonderful and uh, great and strong and brave that this talk will take place due to all circumstances we didn't know before. And if we have the chance, but we have recorded this presentation also just in case. And for the discussion afterwards, we have even a translator here because your colleague made it to our conference. And so the stage is yours. We are keen on listening to your presentation entitled Word Communicative Potential in Contemporary Vocal Music. I am glad that in this rather difficult condition for Ukraine, I can join a real scientific celebration. Thank you a lot for the invitation and the opportunity to present my topic. My report will be on video. Enjoy watching it. In vocal music, a composer works with two main components, the word and the sound. The relationship forms a different communicative potential of the word in a composition, underlining or undermining the word's role in communication. The early 20th century witnessed changes in composers' approach to working with verbal texts. Firstly, the frame of text expands, becoming the verbal basis of vocal works. Composers introduce philosophical treatises, political slogans, daily phrases, etc. Secondly, it is often not the meaning of the verbal text that is important, but its phonism. Moreover, the sound of the text becomes variated due to multilingual layers, working with the words internal structure, implementing phonemic roles, uh, Joseph Hominsky term, and so on. Composers work at the same level both with the meaning and the structure of the verbal role. Accordingly, it is necessary to analyze both the sense and the structural levels in order to research the communicative potential of the word. Our attention will further be concentrated at one of the analysis methods at poorly structural level. Any verbal language is a system in which various elements coexist. William von Gumboldt first began to talk about it in early 19th century. The idea that language is a system led to images of various interpretation of its internal structure. Emil Benveniste proposed to view language structure as a four-leveled one. His concept of internal structure of language was adopted by the linguists and uh, is still generally used nowadays. Thus, the lowest level of language is a phonological. The main element of this level is the phoneme. The next level is morphological, the morpheme being the key. Then comes the lexical semantic level, where the lexeme plays a leading role. The last level is the syntax, where a sentence is the most important expression of the language system. Each element of the language structure performs its own functions. The leading function of a sentence is communicative. On the one hand, sentence is a structural unit of language, consists of, of elements from the lower levels, lexemes, or morphemes, and phonemes. On the other hand, sentence conveys the meaning and is used to transmit information. When composer works at the level of a sentence, it is important to stick to the verbal text structure and convey information to the meaning of a certain sentence. Therefore, language elements are seen as rings liked in a chain to form the meaning of a sense. The integrity of such chain is more important than a separate phoneme of morpheme. Composer selects to underlie key words in which certain morphemes are singled out by gesture and rhythm. 
If composer concentrates the work at the level of a sentence, uh, the following items in a vocal part are important. First, dramatize the sense centers. Separate words in a sentence. Second, uh, emphasize the syllables in words to understand the meaning of these words. Third, pay attention to punctuation as the melody movement with a smoother jumping depends on it. Uh, let us illustrate a composer work at the level of a sentence using the example of the tenor solo in part one of the concerto for chorus, solist, and orchestra by Ivan Kravitz. The composer chose the Garden of Divine Songs by Gregory Skovarda as basis for the verbal component. Placement of accents on syllables in the poetic text in Anwen. Text continues various feet, the basis repeating rhythmic units. Accents fall on the last syllable and in turn uh, on the next last. Each stanza contains four lines divided into two or three feet. Each foot has a different number of syllables, so the accent in the word sound at different times. According to alternating stressed and unstressed syllables, Karabitz forms the rhythmical format of the vocal party. Commas are used for enumeration and highlighting language references. Exclamation marks, in particular in the first two stanzas, close off each sentence. It is these punctuation marks that form speech gesture during reading, as well as vocal melody. The composer is creating it employing different pitch of the sounds. Comma reduces the intercity of pronunciation energy, while the exclamation mark on the contrary increases it. Accordingly, melody moves along in a smaller range in the lines containing a comma. The lines marked by an exclamation sign on the contrary allow for a very wide range of melody for punctuation. More often, it is the last or next to last syllable that is sunk up or down at wind intervals. There are four Krabbit's works at the level of a sentence, as it is important for him to rely on the meaning of Skorovoda's poetic stanza. That is why the vocal party is formed close to the possible reading of the poetic line. This way, Krabbit's music enhances communicative aspect of Skorovoda's poetic work. Lexim is the main element of the lexical semantic level. Lexim's most prominent function is nominative. It names objects, phenomena, states, and so on. Each word has both an internal structure, structural layer, a word can be analyzed as a sum of morphemes and phonemes, and an external one, its meaning. Lexical semantic level is most commonly used in composers' works with verbal texts. As a word is a completely and throw element that has a sound cover, internal form, and a meaning, external form. An example of a musical piece where a composer chooses lexical semantic level is the basis for development is Funny Days for Eight Solists by Ludmila Yurina. For 1998 uh, was created for a double solist group, two sopranos, two altos, two tenors, and two baritones. 
A verse lever entitled the same by a beat narration poet Allen Ginsberg served a poetic basis. The support uses asymmetrical long lines, which leads to a variable matter recording the flow of fantasy in a free form, a random association and images, and creating two or three text blocks. Uh, let us further analyze in detail a square in the middle of the text as a manifestation of the poet's graphic thoughts. It is recorded as the point of the golden section of the swag. The word bonk sounds as a culmination and has two layouts, the expression which is formed by four phonemes, B-O-N-G, and the meaning. This word has a certain sense which could be considered by the verb sleeper's author. In the musical version of this word, Yurina does not choose separate phonemes, but rather uses the word bong as a whole to end the work with it. In the last seven bars, two of which are fully devoted to pauses in the funny days, the word bong is repeated 12 times. At the same time, the composer creates the accumulation effect and fading sound by means of increasing at first the number of solists, 3, 5, and 8 and then decreasing their number, uh, while they whisper just one word, 8, 6, 4, 2, and 4. Concentrating on the lexical semantic level, the composer mainly involves both components of this level, the structure and the meaning. Thus, uh, for the structure, the present born as a whole word. When working with the meaning, she relies on noise sounds uh, that underline the word sense which is formed differently for each listener. Therefore, Uranus music enhances the meaning of the poetic word. Accordingly, language communication comes to the foreground. Amorphy is the key element of the morphological level. Its main function is semiological, which means to express a notion. A morphem is the bifrontal language element. Just as a lexem, it can be characterized in two ways, relying on the meaning, the contents, or based on the structure, the expression. A morpheme has both a structural level, formed by phonemes, and a meaning level. It is especially noticeable when a segmental morpheme is developed, that is the root of a word. The root can appear as a lexeme and as a set of phonemes. This thesis will be illustrated by pastels for soprano, violin, viola, cello, and double bass by Ronin Grabowski, a work writing in 1964, a poem of Pomodicina. The frame of the first part is a phrase pro big zaychik, Ukrainian, a banyuran, repeated twice. The composer develops the first part pro big much more actively, so our attention is focused on it. In Ukrainian, the lexem pro big is formed with segmental morphemes. Uh, the word root big and prefix pro preceding the root. However, B can appear not only as a root, but as a separate lexeme as well. It is the bifrontal nature of the segmental morpheme B that the composer is demonstrating by repeating it five times. While the level of meaning is present can be demonstrated based on the soprano score line, the structural level is absent. Hrabowski keeps the wall formation not splitting B into phonemes. Accordingly, this word can be interpreted both as a lexeme as a morpheme. It is, in our opinion, more appropriate to interpret big as a segmental morpheme, the root of the word probig, as this is the way it is written in the original verbal source. This way, Hrabowski's music does not change the meaning of the Chinese poetic lines, uh, but strengthens the meaning. 
Thus, communication with the audience takes place through the text in the first place. A phoneme is a foundation of any language. It is characterized in various ways and there is still no and most likely will not be unified formulation of it. We rely on a generalized definition adopted by the majority of linguists. Phoneme is the smallest indivisible element of language that people perceive through certain graphic things, sounds or gestures, as a certain sound in speech, a certain letter in writing, or a certain gesture in sign language. Options of definition are presented in works of Mikhail Kuchergan, Alexander Potemnia, Alexander Rafamansky, Ferdinand Sussur, Nikolai Trubetskoy, and others. Vocal music of the 20th and early 21st centuries witnessed a tendency of toning to a phoneme, which becomes a full-fledged and fundamental element of the piece. It is not combined into a morpheme and a word, but functioned on its own. Accordingly, the level of perception of a phoneme as a separate entity begins to dominate while the level of meaning emerges in the audience's subjective perceptions. Anna Corson's landscapes can serve as an example of a work in which the author operates at the level of phonemes only. The piece landscapes uh, predominantly demonstrate noise sound. In addition to them, Corson involves rhythmical learn and lip tremor. In the beginning, the composer introduces short duration for a certain sound. The vowel phonemes are added to this duration, and at the end, consonants as well. This way, the composer moves along from a long sustained duration without phonemes to a short duration, which is stressed by a vowel phoneme. The composer works with the sound in a traditional way, but she changes the material itself, mostly using noise sounds rather than tones as it is uh, honest with a defined pitch. Respectively, communication with the audience takes place not via the text meaning or purely language communication, but through the sound of individual phonemes or by the methods of extracting sounds. With these phonemes, listener forms the over meaning of the work. Therefore, a composer can work at four language levels in vocal piece phonological, morphological, lexical, semantic, and syntaxis. Each level requires attention to its basis elements, phonemes, morphemes, lexemes, and sentence. Accordingly, analyzes the element which composer works with, we reach a certain language level, which makes it clear what exactly is important to the author, to realize the meaning of the verbal lines, to present one word which gives way to all morphemes and phonemes, or to demonstrate possibilities in options of extracting one phoneme, and so on. Frequently, composers do not limit themselves to one language level, but move from one to another, which indicates the variety of available options to work with a verbal line when creating a vocal opus. If we consider a verbal word to be a channel of communication, it can be assumed that the more of composer work is aimed at conveying the meaning of the words while the melody line duplicates the verbal line. The closer approach is to poorly verbal communication. The more changes are made to the original verbal source, and closer it is the poorly musical communication, where the sound comes with a foreground. 
Therefore, owing to the linguistic concept of language levels, we can analyze which level undergoes the most changes to reveal which type of communication a composer is closer to the language one or the music one. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much for recording this presentation and thank you very much for joining us. In order to make you feel at home a little bit, we might share now one microphone for the translation with uh, Irina. Are there any questions? In, you understood what I said? Irina, uh, translate, please. <laughs> ah, translate, please. Uh, so, thank you very much for your presentation. Maybe there are any questions for you and for that you joined us. So please yes. don't hesitate to ask any question. She's a very reliable person and translator. We are looking for questions. Wait. Don't push. We have one question. <laughs> um, no, please. Uh, I uh, wonder um, the composer's own um, sensibilities. Uh, because some, uh, like Kurtak, for instance, uh, some contemporary composers, uh, they love literature and poetry, and they're able to get under surface of the uh, any level. Like they, um, I would argue that some composers express subtext of uh, poetry, and but some maybe connect to uh, poetry mostly emotionally. So how does it inform the listener? Um, like uh, analyzing music from the structural level, right? It informs an analyst and professional musicians. But um, how does it help a performer to connect to the music, especially if you don't understand the language? Суть питання, чи правильно я зрозуміла, якщо композитор працює на різних рівнях, то чи це доноситься слухачу, чи слухач теж відчуває це різні рівні, немає музичної світи. Якщо він заходить внутрі, тобто композитор не завжди працює суто за структурою. Структура – це зовнішня, структурна. А коли е, сучасні композитори, like, о, е, типа Куртага, та, коли вони заходять всередину і вже працюють з внутрішнім таким сенсом цього поетичного слова, наскільки це може якби, зрозуміти і передати виконавець, наскільки оці, от, наші структурні рівні вони тут допомагають. Вот так вот, скорее всего. Дякую за питання. Ймовірніше, допомагають, адже нас цікавить, що на якому рівні працює композитор, і відповідно з цього рівня можна зрозуміти, що для нього важливо. Стоп, стоп, я перекладу. Я не можу так. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I said stop because it is very uh, difficult for me. I know I am not translator. Uh, uh, thank you for your question. And uh, Ina uh, uh, thinks uh, that um, it is uh, very important for us uh, when we're analyzing uh, this text to understand what uh, in which level composer works because it uh, shows uh, um, composer uh, relationship to the text and the level, not only structure and this um, sense of this text. Dale. Так. І якщо композитор працює на рівні сенсу, то зрозуміло, що в першу чергу слухач буде считувати цей текст. Да? Тобто комунікація пряма, композитор-слухач, uh, ну, як на мене. Uh, і, якщо... And if composer works at the level of the sense, uh, he um, will be put attention his to this level and uh, building the uh, direct communication, uh, he, uh, the 
composition and a listener. And it is, uh, if for composer important that sense and that um, a listener understand this sense, uh, he will be building such level of communication and uh, putation for this uh, semantic level. Yes. Так, mm -hmm. але ситуація ще складніша, тому що е, композитор може формувати свій текст, і він формує свій сенс, не текст, свій сенс. А слухач зі свого досвіду буде е, опиратися і формувати свої сенси. І тому говорити про якийсь один унікальний сенс, який має бути в цьому творі, як на мене, дуже складно. And the uh, situation more differ because a uh, composer forming its own sense and then a listener uh, <laughs> have possibility to listen to this text, the listener forming e uh, each own own senses because uh, every listener uh, uh, ha, uh, listener uh, has its own experience and the connection of different experience composers composer senses of the in this composition and listener experience they forming this communication situation this music and verbal roles role roles and um, the senses and level of senses Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this impressive cooperation and for making <laughs> it possible to take part in that conference. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, okay, I, one last question. Yeah, I, it's not really a question. It's um, first of all, thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, but uh, I wanted to mention that there is like another side of the coin of it. And uh, you were talking only about music, uh, the relationship between word and music in vocal compositions. But there's a number of composers who try to implement it in instrumental music and like translating text into actual timbres, notes, rhythms. And that's perhaps a fruit for thought for future. Thank you, thank you for... Uh, in, uh, in так, так, я зрозуміла, що йдеться про те, що е, я говорю про комунікацію лише композитора. З... Ні, 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 що в нас... <laughs> <laughs> she uh, said, I understand and began something said, I, I, I said, no, it's other means that Andreas said. Мається на увазі, що ви говорите тільки про вокальну музику з текстом, а що багато таких от сенсів включається в інструментальну музику, що багато що композитори працюють, якби включаючи оці от вербальні рядки в інструментальні твори і промовляючи інструменталісти промовляють ось ці от, е, твори і що є якби інший підхід. Ірина угу. Геннадзівна, перекладіть, будь ласка, про, да, про твір Алла Загайкевич, що ми знаємо, що є такі твори, однак це наразі не є сферою мого зацікавлення, Добре. можливо, на майбутнє для докторської то буде. Дякую our own such uh, example, for example, piece for Bandura and electronics by Alla Zagaykevich, uh, Braza Tufu, there um, she, um, uh, she uh, uses a quotation from a poetry of our Ukraine poets, but uh, these poets, uh, the um, performer, uh, the Bandura performers, not singing, but uh, she plays in such rhythm of uh, these uh, poems. But uh, the fear of interest of Ina, it's only vocal music, but it's, uh, yes, it's a great uh, edition of her theme. Thank you. For her, Alex, next level different dissertation. Now she does only PhD. <laughs> yeah. Finally, this might remind us uh, of what musical analysis might be capable of. Even. Yeah. So thank you once again. This applause is from you.
it's for you from Lithuania. Thank you. Thank you also, dear Irina, for helping out <laughs> and for this very competent translation and for rescuing the last question, respective comment. And now we will go ahead with the last presentation of this, this section. I will practice it. Uh, I'm uh, sorry. It's a composer and uh, currently also belonging to the staff of the Lithuanian Acad Academy of Music and Theatre. And her presentation is entitled The Tendencies of Musical Texture Resolutions in 21st Century Lithuanian Composers' Works. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to be a part of this conference. Unfortunately, I'm not able to participate live today, but still I'm really happy and thankful for the organizers for their support um, and understanding. So today I would like to present um, my paper. I hope you can see it quite well. Individual composition strategies in music composing determine a unique artistical result. Because of different strategies, composers are able to create a music piece that has exclusive features to which the work is recognized as individual and appreciable in the general context of many works. While exploring the strategies of music composing, it is important to pay attention to the phenomenon of musical texture as another extremely bright and informative point that helps to understand the uniqueness and creative vision of composers' minds. In order to describe the phenomenon of musical texture, there are quite a lot of problems simply because the phenomenon of textures interpreted in many different ways. The complexity is determined by the wide range of issues and forms of expression of this phenomenon. It is worth, worth recognizing that the texture of a musical piece can be specified as a means for an individual composing solution, as a sign of recognition of the identity of the piece or the entire creation. Such examples can be Ligeti's micropolyphonic textures, Yanulita's breathing music textures, or Metakshaita's textures connected with patterns created in textiles. However, paradoxically, one also faces opposition to such an approach, claiming that the phenomenon is just the result determined by the chosen composing strategies and tools. So texture itself is recognized as a result of expression of all tools. Therefore, it can be assumed that the importance of texture in the creative process is not potentially emphasized by itself. Recognizing it as a result determined by the composing strategy, it is important to look at the analysis of this phenomenon, because thanks to the texture, the process of creating a work, the structural idea, ideas and strategies of composing can be understood. As a result, it is assumed that in order to justify the meaning and importance of musical texture in the 21st century composer's music, it is worth paying attention to the individual ways of managing its expression and also raising the question, what determines the unique texture patterns in their works? One question arises naturally. Do composers especially think about musical texture in their creative process? Is it worth saying that texture is some kind of phenomenon that all composers are constantly thinking about? I would like to try to re re reveal the approach of Lithuanian authors to the phenomenon of texture. When searching for answers, it is useful to focus attention on the possible different ways of managing individual musical textures in the context of Lithuanian composers. In order to find out the individual strategies, I prepare some questions about musical textures and its importance for the composer's mindset and shared with, uh, it with the selected composers. This was uh, intended to clarify how different authors manage the musical texture and what tools they apply to organize it. 
we're talking about composers, uh, Justyna Nulytė, Gitė Medakšaitė, Rytis Mažulis, Agnė Mažulienė, Andrius Širys, Raimondas Žiukaitė, Richardas Kabelis, Giedra Paulikevičiūtė Dabulskienė, Ramita Širikšnytė participated in this analysis. The survey surprised me than, more than expected. First of all, I did not receive answers to the question I sent them, but attend questions about what a musical texture is in general, what is the definition of a texture, and how it should or could be treated. Such questions uh, presuppose the answer that the phenomenon of musical texture is not fundamentally conventionally defined. It is assumed that the texture is not a special attention-grabbing phenomenon for composers. It is not especially paid attention to. Hence, the texture in the works of composers who hold such a position seems to be created by itself without conceptualizing the phenomenon, without specifically creating consciously texture management strategies. However, this position once again substantiates the assumption that for the composers who answered the questions, the texture of their opus is the result of certain composing strategies. One of the noticeable tendencies manifested in the work of Lithuanian composers is that the musical texture is not an independent phenomenon. It is the result of the application of composing models. A Gideon in this case looks like a great and exact example. The philosophy of the Indian Raga is important to Medakshayat in her creative process. As she states by herself, quote starts, I try to distance myself from Western definitions and perceive uh, and create music as an Indian musician would describe it, quote ends. The composer does not concept conceptualize texture as organizing creative tools. However, such a position can be understood ambiguously. On the one hand, the author tries to distance herself from Western definitions and concepts, as well as avoids using them to describe her work. On the other hand, the relationship of the music she creates with textiles and patterns is particularly important in her work. The author claims that only after becoming interested in fabric patterns, the chosen fabric became a unique structure for the musical material. However, such a fabric is not necessarily understood as the primary structure for the musical material. Sometimes, after discovering a certain musical idea, the author looks for a suitable fabric that has a pattern closest to the musical idea. Quote starts, as a composer, it is more important for me to use that to compose a piece, use forms, ideas, or structures. Both, uh, ends. However, for Medekshaiti, compositional thinking outside the boundaries of structures is important. When the author conveys the fabric affecting music and composes it, not just conveys it schematically. According to the uh, author, the charm of textiles is revealed thanks to many different characteristics. For example, code starts, how the threads connect, uh, what are the spaces between them, uh, and so on, quotes, uh, ends. Um, however, Mendekshaite's idea of a connection between music and textiles is not presupposed by the desire of accurately represent the fabric structure in music. She strives for creative freedom and looks for the most suitable solution, claiming that the result is absolutely different in each case. Hence, talking about texture, different patterns and their solutions, analogs in music, becomes uh, an analog of the modal level, which encourages the author's creative self-expression. Self the juxtaposition of the flow of music and the principles of creation with textiles is one of the most special connections, which uniquely distinguishes Metakshaita from other Lithuanian composers. Summarizing Medakshaita's approach to the musical texture and the textural solutions prevailing in her work, it can be said that three components are important to the author. The first one is the musical idea, the second one is Indian Raga, and the third one, textile patterns. A certain hierarchy is this, um, um, you can see here a certain hierarchy, with the most important of the three being the spot of the musical idea. According to Medakshaita, without a musical idea, textile patterns have no meaning because there must be a basis on which the pattern will be built. Along with the musical idea as the first element and the textile pattern, with, which helps realize the musical idea, the raga is also important. 
Hence, the main differences that distinguishes Medak Shaita from other structuralists, for example, Ritus Marjulis, Charles Cabalis, is that the author pays special attention to the emotion and the atmosphere of the work. She bases this approach on the tradition of Indian ragas, where a raga is more than a structure. It is kind of philosophy that goes far beyond the structure itself. Agne Marjuliene also agrees with the direct dependence of uh, textures on the selected composing models. She claims that texture solutions appears in her work not as creative prototypes, but as a consequence of the uh, development of the musical structure. In Marjuliene's work, the greatest attention is focused on figurative notation. Figurative scores in her work are not just a conceptual, conceptual solution. The composer recognizes pre-compositional material as the main and primary composing strategy. The way of managing the pre-compositional material and the chosen strategy usually determines the entire principle and determines the composition model. According to Majuliene, uh, quotation starts, after finding the grain of a, of a piece, an interesting sounding element or structure development algorithm, I start to think about its realization for selected instruments, the, re the relationship between different parts, the amount of musical information per unit of time, the speed of change, so I solve questions of texture, uh, quote ends. As can be seen, uh, Marjuliene does not specifically raise the issue of texture in the work, but it figures in the creative process. As she said, say, I solve questions of musical texture only when I already have the basics of the musical material. In Marjuliene's opinion, uh, issues of texture are most closely related to the cons uh, consistency of the change of musical material. However, the composer does not look for individual texture management strategies and chooses already existing directions that most respond to her own perspective and composing. But looking for an individualized way of solving the problem of texture, the attention turns to certain compositional preferences of the composer and what strategies he or she chooses in cre uh, creative process. For example, almost all of Rita's Marjulis uh, works uh, are canons. However, when comparing works from different periods uh, of Marjulis, different texture patterns are discovered. For example, the whole Chordal texture used uh, for four keyboard instruments in the first part of uh, Chaushkan Timashina, Twittering Machine, according to Majulis, um, is based on the principle of rhythmical complementarity. Every 16th note of a new chord appears in the part of another instrument. This also determines the development of the texture, since the chords are exchanged and complement each other during the piece. Summing up this approach of, uh, to musical texture, it can be seen that the authors giving priority to the structural idea of composition discovers methodol methodologies with certain strict conditions, create the texture with full confidence in the pre-compositional material. In other words, the texture is created by itself, as if growing it from the original pre-compositional material. As a result, the texture in the case of Marjulis is strict, strictly determined. Unlike the work of Medakshaita, Marjulis or Marjuliene, where the texture is determined by the chosen compositional tools, Jubokla Martinaitita pays special attention to the texture itself. Martinaitita's case uh, echoes the second characteristic in full approach, when the musical texture is recognized as one of the fundamental principles of structuring the work. According to her, the texture is autonomous. Speaking about the um, peculiarities of her work, she says that texture is one of the essential structuring principles. The composer thinks uh, about it even before she starts composing, because, quote, starts in the texture of the music, the set of small gestures can communicate some bigger ideas, as in nature, where beauty is revealed through fractal forms, their repetition at various scales. In the hierarchy of parameters, I bring the texture to the fork. I give primary importance to this. When structuring the work, I think about the uh, gradation of texture, the difference, and even the base of their changes. Sometimes I make texture maps with density and transparency levels marked. In my music, the layering of material is important. 
Sometimes the basis of musical material is the layering of dynamic waves in various groups of instruments. In a sense, the texture, the textured wall is for me like an impressionist pain, painting in which many individual micro movements vibrate and flicker and only their totality, which is seen from a distance, from a perspective, has meaningful weight, quote, ends. Martinaitide distinguishes three principles of structuring musical texture, uh, which she relies on, on in her works. work. Mm, this is uh, layering, uh, microscopic decomposition of the melodic element, and texture density and transparency. Justine Janulite also places great importance on texture in her work and claims that the music she creates is primarily a texture, as if a given coming from the composition of the instruments. Hence, in Janulite's music, texture management is based on specific cases dictated by instrumentation. So, um, quote starts, the role of texture is directly related to instrumentation, quote ends. It can be argued that the composer chooses a single plan strategy of texture management and maintains it through the piece. For example, in, in the work Unanime, Unanime for eight trumpets, the texture of the music does not change from the beginning to the end. In the composition, the harmony changes cycl uh, cyclically, uh, Cyclically, the register, re, register expands, the dynamics intensify and fade, but the texture remains the same all the time because all eight trumpets play at the same time uh, throughout all the pieces. The eight trumpets seen in the example create the impression of a layered texture which the, with the layers uh, um, uh, Ex, uh, with the layers by the change in the range of sounds, each instrument continues. Similar texture patterns can be found in the previously discussed works of Martin Aitite. The texture, according to Janulite, thickens with dynamic growth and becomes transparent with low tides. The composer individually models texture in separate genres and in works with different instrumental compositions. As she said, as she said, I often combine texture elements with timbral steps. Such an approach is also close to Shirikshnite, where the timbre in the texture is understood as a um, factor of the intensity of the texture and the development of the dramaturgy of the piece. As a result, she can be classified as one of those authors who, for, uh, for whom texture is understood as an opportunity for communication. Most of the composers mentioned in this paper, when thinking about the musical texture, single out its importance for the dramaturgy of the piece. The dramaturgy itself naturally draws attention to through about the communication of the work with the listener. Since the emotional experiences of the listeners and the impact of the work of the listeners is not excluded. By naturally juxtapositioning the texture with the dramaturgy, the development of the piece slightly outside of it, as if giving up uh, the composition model certain frames that frame the piece, the piece is viewed as a living organism that communicates both with the listener and with the performer, when the communication is controlled by the author. Music is the fundamental channel of communication. Uh, provides the means by which people are able to communicate, to share emotions, certain intentions and meanings. Music can influence human behavior, cause powerful physical effects and produce deep and profound emotions. As a result, it is assumed that the musical texture can be perceived as a kind of communication system that allows the musical work to actually happen. Communication takes place already in the texture itself. Different musical parameters, timbres, sounds, and forms, rhythms, durations, etc., communicate in the musical structure of the work. From this, it can be understood that the strategy of managing the processes taking place in the texture, in a certain sense, determines the communication of the texture and how the musical processes will communicate. As a result, it is assumed that the creative process of a piece of music linked to the composer's chosen strategy for managing the musical material, as well as the principles of musical texture management. After reviewing the selected composer's approach to the musical texture, of course, in this paper, I mentioned, mentioned just a few of them. 
Certain positions of Lithuanian authors on this issue become clear. They can be divided into three groups. Uh, those uh, uh, who think that musical texture is not an autonomous phenomenon. This is the result of uh, selected strategies depending on selected composing models, etc. Uh, the second, uh, texture is a fairly autonomous phenomenon that is worth thinking about even before starting a piece. The texture management depends on the composer's musical idea. And the last one, the texture phenomenon helps to create communication with the listener. Because of that, the drama dramaturgy of the piece is controlled and an emotional re relationship with the listener is created. So, thanks a lot. Um, I would like to say thank you again and uh, wishing you uh, the nice day. So, have a nice day and bye. Thank you. She's not online, so we uh, can't proceed with any discussion, but maybe outside. Yes, yeah. then we made it in time finally we have now some spare time and so do you have any question dina please no i can't answer i feel not competent of course but we might discuss together about the graphic school of George Crumb, like a score of what these I need to in texture in this symbolic item of the tree of graphic representation of music. But I mean, maybe there is a connection between texture and symbology of. Uh, in Ambiosh, you are about to say something to this. Uh, Harris, Harris, please. I, I finished asking. Yeah. <laughs> um, from the side of a composer and uh, a, a teacher of, of music theory, I cannot uh, underline how important is the musical texture. Uh, considering now ear training, the students think you go first term, one voice dictat, second term, two voices, three and four, and we finished. And uh, it's really important that the students can hear textures, no matter if it is a piece of popular music, of contemporary, of classical. Uh, yeah, this is a subject that needs to be um, more expensive. Uh, extended and I think that could be a very good idea for a future conference musical uh, you know, texture just yeah 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 ah, was texture okay 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 yeah so it is a very important uh, issue which uh, the students are also composers are not be sufficiently trained to to listen and to think about music texture. So uh, at least at my University of Graz, yeah, it's very important. I just can't resist, uh, can't resist uh, jumping in. <clears throat> uh, let's see, uh, there are so many things that I'd like to say in that connection. Yeah, it's very true. We teach them harmony, we teach them music forms, we teach them counterpoint, but in in a, in a very different way. Uh, and uh, nobody has ever, my university, uh, nobody has ever uh, thought of defining what, what texture is in the first place. We even have a problem that uh, translating the word texture uh, we can say in Serbian, we can say textura, but it is not a very common word in music theory parlance. Um, on the other hand, we have a similar word, but it is not really quite, uh, you know, there, there is a huge overlap, but there it's not one-to-one -one mapping between our term factura and the texture as used in English. Yeah. Factura, yeah. 
but the closer to the texture is actually our word factura, which is not exactly the same. So it's uh, something gets lost in the translation. And then uh, I, if I can be quite, you know, from, from a very uh, subjective position, uh, uh, whether I, as a composer, start from texture or from some other ideas which are then connected with texture is very much a question of the ensemble I'm writing for. There's simply certain, again, quite subjective uh, view, there are certain uh, combination of instruments which first bring to my mind you know how how can I weave these lines together, get certain timbres, get certain, and uh, in some other cases it's simply oh if it's this combination of instruments, then uh, I will definitely start with something else and the texture will somehow result from everything else. So. The question I was going to ask, actually, which is, of course, to remain unanswered, whether this is an impression or whether this is a, an experience of our composers, the composers that our colleague interviewed. That's just a thought. Thank you. I see this section set us in fire, and you might continue discussing this. Thank you so much. Now we have some spare time. Thank you, everyone, for today. Uh, it was a very fruitful discussion and very interesting presentations. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I would like to invite you this evening at 6 p.m. to the Grand Hall of the Academy, just upstairs. Uh, there will be a concert, Unidentified Cycles of Michalowicz Konstantinos Chilonis. It's a concert of piano music uh, performed by students of Professor Jurgis Karnavichus. Unfortunately, this event will not be broadcasted online. So for our online participants, we'll see you tomorrow.